be just waking up. And, uh, and then, of course, people in Australia, their day is coming to an end. So what is everybody up to? Who's watching? What are you doing while you're watching? I'm always curious. Love to know. I'd like to find more elephant this afternoon too. So Brian, we need to keep a lookout for elephant. Elefanti. My favorites. Some nice birds flying around already. A lot of European rollers that I've seen. And those hornbills that flew off earlier. And then um, Taylor is going to be on the other vehicle this afternoon with us. Uh, with David and James will be walking with Craig again. I think uh, James will be carrying his big stick. I used it this morning, so thank you James for allowing me to use your big stick. Just in case, in, <laughs> in case something comes out the bush at us, at least we've got a stick. Um, perhaps you can ask James about my broomstick story if you are curious. He's got a lovely story about a broomstick and myself. Alright, so we're going to be going live very soon with the uh, official start of the show. We'll see you a little bit later. I think we're going to be starting with Taylor. And um, yes, so that's it from us for now. We'll chat to you later. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody. You are suspended here in animated water across central lobes of South Africa. It's about 23 degrees Celsius here. It's about 88 degrees Fahrenheit. My name is James Henry. It's wonderful to be here with us on safari. You know, that little thing that we're doing there was a to see if the drone picture would work. I have no idea if you can see me or the drone now. Anyway, whatever it was, I thought you got some of good pick. And I'm confused. This is live. I'm deeply confused as to whether you saw the drone the first time round or if you were just looking at my face with a wobbly picture. Anyway, it is, uh, like I said, 35 degrees Celsius odd plus minus 90 odd degrees Fahrenheit, and we're now being circled by the drone. Are you looking at the drone shot or at me? Oh, good. Okay, so you can see us standing there. You can see Herbie, and you can see... <laughs> You can see Craig and you can see me over here. Let me tell you how that was supposed to go, everybody. What was supposed to happen is that the drone was supposed to come whizzing along and then up into the air over the top of us as you snap to me. I'm off air now. Oh, never mind. I don't know what's going on. Let's go for a walk. Out on vehicle today, Taylor. And she is with, uh, I think she's with David. And Brian is lurking around. Our plan this afternoon is to just down here, the rather irritated little elephant bull. I just see him nip through here, and I suspect he's gone towards the water at the Gallego Pan, so we might just go and have a look and see if he's there. And while we do that, well, you can come along with us.
Right, we'll go down through this drainage system here, and I think we might lose signal. So while we do that, head across to Taylor, find out what her plans are. I shall recover from that introduction. Hopefully see you shortly with the infant. Good afternoon, and it's well, it's a stunning day out here in South Africa, but I'm sure James has already told you that. Now, my name is Taylor McCurdy, and on camera with me this afternoon is Davy Gravy. Oh, it's just David, but you can call him. Well, seeing as though we were talking about nicknames this morning, I thought I'd just throw David's one out. Davy Gravy, yes. Now, we're on this big, windy, dusty road at the moment, and we're heading towards a Cheetah Plains, and hopefully we are going to find some cats there. I'd also like to see some elephants this afternoon, maybe a buffalo or two, and, well, we really just see what else we can do, and then we're hoping to end off with a beautiful sunset uh, this evening, possibly at uh, Chitwa Chitwa, somewhere around there. We'll find a good spot to have a have a look and see what is going on. Now remember we are on a live safari and well we're happy to have you have you here there we go that was my slang for the day and myself James and Byron will try and happily answer any of your questions uh, that you send through so remember hashtag safari live for Twitter just in case you've forgotten and questions at wildearth.tv now I must say welcome to everybody from Strawbridge Elementary Woo! I hope you're excited to go on safari with us uh, this afternoon and I'd like to hear from you what animals you'd like to try and see. Maybe this is your first safari with us and you are, I'm sure you're all very, very excited. So tell us, tell your teachers what animals you'd like to see and then we will try our absolute best to try and find them for you this afternoon. Hopefully we're going to have a good day, hey David? Yes. Are we going to check watering holes today? Yes. I think we need to check the watering holes because it is so hot this afternoon. Let's see what's here, it's the first watering hole. And we seem to stop at this all the time. And there's normally a pair of guinea fowl, which is a bird with, that is black with little white spots on it. And it has a blue head. Hang on, David. I think I'm seeing something. It could be a stump. I'm just going to go forward a little bit. That's what you've got to do when you're out here on safaris. You've got to look. What is that? It, it's the base of the tree. Look at that. I've spotted. What have I spotted, David? It's a, just a tree, really. Hey? That's very good spotting for me. That beautiful marula tree. <laughs> but to me, from over here, it actually looked like it could have been maybe a buffalo. And I thought, well, it would be a good place to be sitting right here because of that little mud wallow that you all just saw. It would be a nice place to cool off. But no buffalo for us, no guinea fowl for us. So we'll just have to keep searching. No, there's nothing. But that's fine. <clears throat> We're going to... We're going to be searching, of course, for cats and any other creatures, and hopefully we will have lots to show you by the time we get to Cheetah Plains. But like I said, it's myself and James, and you're going to go across now to say and meet Byron. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name is Byron, and with me on camera this afternoon is Brian and his very famous thumb. <laughs> Now, we are in search of leopards. Now, I'm trying to see if I can't find Karula and her youngsters uh, and her two cubs. They were in this area, but apparently there was a lot of hyena activity around and may have stolen the kill or the remains of the kill that she had. So I'm just going to have a careful look around here um, because they were apparently moving backwards and forwards north and south of our boundary. So stick with us we're having a good look it would be wonderful to see them I haven't seen them this year um, yet uh, so I'd love to see them and see how they're doing it's not always easy to find these li little leopards as you know I also think that perhaps you know if it's a very very warm day like this that perhaps they would head towards a little water hole or dam to get a drink and I'm hoping that if that's the case, we, we can.
can uh, we can find them. Um, I hope all of you are having a wonderful day. It's very very warm for us out here. Um, see some elephant tracks around here, but doesn't look too fresh. Now I'm just going to scan very very carefully. Uh, up in the trees, you never know, these little cubs are very, very active at the moment. They do climb trees, they sit on top of termite mounds. And I'm going to look very carefully to see if I... I'm trying to see if we don't find any of these, these leopards around somewhere. Don't forget everyone, send us your questions. Especially the young kids watching, uh, ask your teachers to send us your questions through uh, either through Twitter at hashtag Safari Live or email us questions at wildearth.tv. I'm just having a look around here now. So, as I said, these leopards were in this area this morning, but I think because of all the hyena activity, they could very possibly have moved off. So let's see what we can find. I'm just having a look here too, as I said, trying to look for little tracks, signs that they may have come back onto our side, or if they are hiding in the bushes somewhere around here. And because it's so warm, these leopards are probably hiding in the shade. They don't like the heat very much. So they could be right under a bush in a thicket, very dense thicket, which make it very difficult for us to spot them. So unless we've got a clear sign of where they are, I think we're going to struggle a little bit. And you see everybody, this is what makes it so exciting about being on a safari. So you don't know if you're definitely going to find what you're looking for, but we will do our best. And that's what being in a wild environment is all about. Uh, it's never a guarantee if you're going to see the animals, but that makes it so much more rewarding when you do see them, so that you, you do appreciate just how difficult it is to find these animals, and if they are around. Right. I don't see any sign of them here at the moment. I think, uh, I think what we're going to do is probably head towards one of our water holes or one of our dams. Let's go have a look around there and see if there's anything that might have gone for a drink. Especially when it's so hot, a lot of animals do need water. And uh, we might be lucky and find something interesting close to the water hole. But we're going to stay in, around this area because I don't think that uh, these leopards would have moved very far today in this heat. While I head to the dam, my friend James is busy walking in the bush. Let's go say hello. Hello everybody, here we are standing with a warthog. Now I think we're talking to Str now I think we're talking to Strawbridge Elementary School and it's lovely to have you with us. I'm talking very and he gets scared by our voices. I'm speaking very quietly. Also, hello to all of you in Lynn Haven School. I hope you have a good day at school. It's not too hot where you are. It's very hot where we are here. And that's why that warthog is standing at the water. He's hoping to cool down. So we're going to move slowly to here. Cool down. So we're going to move to here. Very good to have you with us. And I hope that you ask us lots of questions as we go through this day. But before we try and find the dog again, let's head across to Bowen. Oh dear, it sounds like James is having a little bit of a signal issue for the moment. That will be fixed soon, but I don't mind having you on the back of your vehicle with me. Maybe you can give me a hand at looking for these leopards. I'm driving very, very slowly. Also trying to see if I can find any tracks. So looking on the sandy roads. But for the meantime, nothing just yet. And 
the problem is, is I keep seeing things in the bush and my mind makes me think that it is a leopard but <laughs> it's not this time we try we, we, we occasionally convince ourselves that there might be something there when it isn't the case What do you think, Brian? Good idea to check the water? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Let's have a look. The birds seem to be a little bit quiet too. Let's see. I see um, a few little birds. A southern black tit is flying around and a fork-tailed drongo. But difficult to focus on that. I'll see if they sit down for you so I can show you. See, occasionally these little birds, you get a fleeting glimpse and they disappear. So it's difficult to show you what they are. Um, but I will try and look for, for one. See if we can find you some bird life. Some wonderful birds around this time of the year. So it's in summer, down in South Africa or Southern Africa where we are, the, um, the bird life is really, really good because we also get a lot of birds that migrate, that come back down here during the summer because of the warm weather, the warm climate, and a lot of them do come down and breed down in this area. So they can lay their eggs, the chicks are happy because there's lots of food, lots of insects for most of those birds to feed on. So it's a good time of year for the bird life to be down here. We haven't seen any animals yet and I think perhaps they're not enjoying the heat as much so they're probably hiding in the shade of the trees in the thickets. Ah, uh, Jonathan, very, very good question. You want to know what type of food do you eat while on safari? Now, Jonathan, it can vary, but most of the lodges that people book into and go on safari to Carl, you wanted to know how small are some of the birds that we get out here. So, Carl, some of the birds that we see, uh, one of the some of the smallest birds, little. Uh, oh, let me show you actually while I think about it. Let me just stop in the shade here, and I can show you nicely. Um, we've got little wax bills, and those are some of the smallest little birds that we get out here. And I'll show you a picture of the wax bill first, and then. Uh, and then I'll show you exactly how how big they are. Okay, so have a look here. That beautiful little bird. Can you see it there? How's oh, that? It doesn't cast a shadow. There we go. Beautiful little blue waxbill. 
Now that tiny little bird is one of the smaller, smaller birds that we see around here. Um, now that little one, if it was sitting next to me, it would probably only be about that big. So very, very small, not, not big at all. We've also got little sunbirds, which are also around that size. So we've got some very small birds, but we also have very large birds. We've got raptors, which we find around here. Now those are birds of prey, like eagles or vultures. Now some of the eagles can get to about this tall, if they were standing in front of me, even more. Um, really, really big, and vultures even taller than that. So we've got some very big birds in the area too. So from that size all the way to those very large eagles, which is great. Hopefully we'll get to show you some eagles a little bit later. We do have quite a few different eagles in this area, so who knows. Just got to keep an eye out for them. Going to scan around here a little bit too, make sure I don't miss anything. No sign of leopards just yet. Coral, you want to know what type of habitat are we in at the moment? So, South Africa, and where we are right down in the southern point of Africa, has got, a, has got many different types of habitat. We are situated in the northeastern part of South Africa, in the Greater Kruger area, and most of it, and this area especially that we are in at the moment, is it's known as mixed, uh, mixed woodland, or yeah, th that would probably be the best term. Um, a mixed woodland vegetation and we call it this woodland vegetation because of the various trees that we do see around here. Uh, we've got a lot of combretum trees. Now this is actually a combretum tree right here. So this mixed woodland does consist a lot of these combretum trees. Now this little one over here is called a, a red bush willow. Um, that is, and the scientific name is Combretum, but the scientific names are very, very difficult. But it's called a bush willow. So mixed, mixed woodland is basically correct. So you've got some really large trees, uh, some medium-sized trees, and then a lot of grass around. Um, now, a lot of the, uh, let me just move. Somebody's just coming. Um, a lot of areas you might know uh, as forest areas. Now, the reason for that is is that forest areas forest areas are when the canopies of the trees all touch one another so they've got very very large um, large trees but the canopies the tops of the trees touch each other and that'll cover an entire area that's a forest we don't have that out here the trees are big but they spaced out so it's mixed woodland because the trees are spaced there's a lot of grass in between them so I hope that answers your question now my friend Taylor is still out on drive she has just got to Cheetah Plains let's head over to her and see what she's got Hello, hello. So, Rebecca, sorry, I just want to let Rebecca know a little message that the communal occasion is a little bit not wonderful over here. But we've arrived safely at Cheetah Plains. And now Ephraim and I, Ephraim is a ranger from Cheetah Plains, we are going to search the property. He's Searching the southern sector, we're going to check the northern sector towards the east. And there's a beautiful big dam on uh, the east, right on the eastern corner. And hopefully, we're going to find maybe something drinking from that beautiful big watering hole, or perhaps maybe we're going to see some really cool birds at that dam too. It's a beautiful one. It's called Buffalo Dam. Maybe we even get lucky enough to see the odd buffalo because we haven't been seeing many buffalo around over the last few days. David, we go this way? Yes, we do go this way. I have to just check with David because he knows these roads very, very well. So we're now just going to stick all the way on the boundary and head all the way down this side. 
And it's been very quiet. We haven't even seen any... Oh, hang on. Look at what we've got. Don't run away. Don't run away. Finally. Now, this is this one of the smallest antelope that we see in this area. Let me go forward a little bit so we can catch up to it. It's called a common... Not a common dacre. That is another antelope. We're looking at a steenbok at the moment. There he is, but he's very shy. There he is. And I can tell that he's a boy because he's got two little horns on top of his head. And you can see he's very quick and he's able to leap and bound away. Now he's a little bit nervous of us because he is so small. He's one of the smallest prey species out here for a lot of the big cats, which can cause, well, I think a lot of trouble for that little antelope. So when they feel threatened, they often run away like that, bounding, leaping around different trees, and then they will sit down in the grass. And because they're so small, they completely disappear, and then you can't see them anymore, and that's what they hope will happen uh, to a predator. So that's a nice little antelope to start the day off, and hopefully we will see some more of them. But typically when you see the little steenbok and the common dacre, which is the antelope that's just a little bit bigger than that one and, and more gray in color, not sort of that rust color like the steenbok is. And it'll be, but it's normally a quick view, I suppose. So you've got to look, make sure you're watching all the time and are very, very vigilant. Let's see what else we've got around here. We're going to keep going, making our way to that beautiful big water source known as Buffalo Dam. Apparently James has got something with feathers to show you this afternoon. There's a very little bird sitting up in this tree over here. And I'm going to see if we can spot it. It's called a rattling cysticula. It goes... when it sees anything that it thinks wants to eat it, like a leopard or a African wild cat or a genet or something like that. We'll see if we can't make it come out here. If you want to get a bird to come out, you make that sound. I don't think it's here anymore. Now, Soleil, you're wondering if birds camouflage themselves out here. Yes, they absolutely do. They're almost always very well coloured. But some of them are like the lilac-breasted roller, which we'll try and show you a bit later. Very bright. They've got seven different colours. Purple and lilac and bright blue and white. But this one here, the rattling cysticula, is what we call an LBJ. An LBJ stands for Little Brown Job which basically means that he's almost impossible to see and very difficult to identify what he is. But because I've been here for some time, I know what he is. But he's gone now. Anyway, let's keep going, see what else we can find. While we're on foot, it's a really nice opportunity for us to look at some smaller things. So, like this beautiful flower here. And this one is called a hibiscus. Now, many of you will know these from perhaps some of you have been to Hawaii or you've seen pictures of Hawaii. Of course, it's a state in America, not in America so much, but just off America. And they get lots of hibiscus plants there. And all the way here in South Africa, we get the same thing. It's just a slightly different plant. See the hibiscus? There we go. I think this one's closed because it's probably very hot for the hibiscus and probably stays open only when it's cooler. Nice. Ooh, I found something else. This is one of my favorite things. See there? Look at that. Can you see there? Look at that. That's an ant. And it's a special kind of ant and he doesn't want to sit still. I'll see if I can catch him and stop him moving. <laughs> <laughs> he's, very, he's very clever. Oh, there we go. I got him. Hello, Carson. You're wondering what the temperature is right now. Carson, the temperature is about probably 91 degrees Fahrenheit. Can you see this ant there? If you look just between the abdomen, that's the back bit here, and the thorax, which is the next bit, there are the spikes. Can you see those spikes? 
It's very difficult to see, but that's how we know what he is. Now you can eat these ants, believe it or not. Shall I eat him? Mmm. I didn't eat them. I have eaten one before, and they taste like little lemon drops. Almond taste like lemon drops because they've got an acid in there. That's quite nice, but I feel bad. So put him back on the hibiscus plant. Off he goes. Interesting. Come, let's carry on. Now, we were hoping to find an elephant through here. We did see one a little bit earlier, and when we, you first saw us, and we were standing there with the warthog, we hoped that there would be an elephant drinking at that pan, but there wasn't one. So we're going to walk down here and see if we can't find the water, uh, not the warthog, to try and find the elephant. Byron, however, has got a very, very shaggy looking creature to show you. They are shaggy indeed, James. Beautiful antelope. The waterbuck. And these are two young males. Have a look at that. Beautiful grey shaggy coats. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Look at them. Now, they're easy to identify because of that very white ring around the rump. Can you see them? Uh, Jonathan, you want to know where the animals get their water from? And as I said, I was going to head to one of the dams or water holes, hopefully see some animals and have a look here. That's where we are. So the animals are moving down to the water. These water buck have come down, it looks like, to potentially drink. I'm going to reposition soon, but this is all filled up from the rain that we've had. So Jonathan, these dams, that we, as we call them, they fill up from all the rain that we've had. And that's where the animals are able to find water. Aren't they beautiful? They look almost like reindeer, don't they? However, they are antelope, so very different. So, Lahey, you want to know if we've got paved roads in this area? Not where we are, no, not at all. They are all dirt roads. So that is why we've got 4x4 vehicles that we use. It's easier for us to get around, and if we have to drive off-road, then it helps us if we are following animals like lions and leopards. Raven, this animal is called a water buck. Um, now, the water buck gets its name because they are well, generally very reliant on water, which means they do need a lot of water to drink, and usually they are found close, close to the water. You can see that grey coat also probably helps him with camouflage. I know James was chatting about it earlier. Different animals have camouflage, but that grey coat probably helps him blend into the thickets and the and the grey bark of the trees, especially in winter, probably very, very well. And aren't they aren't they wonderful? So nice to see them. There, there's a few down at the water's edge. Let's see if they do decide to drink. I wonder what they're looking for over there. I would assume that they've purely gone down there to drink. Let's see what happens. But animals, when they do go to drink at water, they're very, very careful. Because when they put their heads down to drink, they can be vulnerable. That means if their predators around, then it could be potentially dangerous for them because they might not see the predators coming. So they're always very, very careful if they get close to water. And there might be predators hiding in the water. And do any of you know what that predator might be that they might find in dams or waterholes? We don't have any in this waterhole, but they do occur in rivers and in other bigger dams. So if any of you know what animal that might be, please, please let me know. And I'll tell you s shortly if you are correct. Ava, you wanted to know what animals have I seen from this morning. Now, I'll answer that now. Just as those water buck move away, I'm going to reposition. And we'll try to drive around and see what else we can find. Now, Ava, this morning, um, James and Taylor were quite lucky. They, um, I think, was it James who got to see? No, Taylor got to see leopards this morning. What did I see this morning? Uh, uh, sure. 
I didn't see too much actually now that I think about it. Oh, I know why. It's because I was on the bushwalk. We did see some impala, but I saw some really interesting little insects. Saw a few moths, saw some termites. So I got to see some really small stuff. Just like what James might be looking for this afternoon. And I know he saw some ants earlier, but there were some other animals around. And yesterday afternoon, I got to see some elephant, a young elephant bull which I'm hoping to find again today. Not the same one, but just some elephant. I love elephant. They're one of my favorite animals. I do enjoy seeing them around. So hopefully we'll be able to find some for you. And different antelope species, the impala, the enyala, which is another antelope that we do get in this area. They are really, really beautiful. Let me show you a picture of the enyala quickly. Uh, let me just find it. Uh, here we go. Now let me just stop in the shade here again. Brian likes the shade, otherwise it's very, very hot. <laughs> and it's a bit easier to show you stuff in the book. Here the Inyala that we saw earlier. Very beautiful females over here. And have a look at how different the male looks. That's the male Inyala. Hopefully I'll be able to find some of them for you. There are a lot around in this area. So maybe we get to see some of those too. Now Ezekiel, you want to know, how is it that the animals all get along in this area? Well, that's not always the case. Now, I say that because you can imagine, lions and leopards obviously don't get along well with the antelope. Well, they do in terms of it's their food, so they try and hunt them. So the lions will move around through areas, especially in the evenings, trying to hunt a lot of different animals, like all the antelope species we have, like waterbuck, the impala, the inyala, all the way up to large animals like big buffalo that they would try, would try and hunt. Uh, don't forget, uh, leopards would also hunt animals like impala and that. So the, the predators would not get along with the animals at all. However, these other species of antelope that we've seen around, like the waterbuck, the impala, the inyala, they will tolerate one another because they are all herbivores, which means they all feed on the same vegetation, whether it be the grass or leaves of trees. So those animals will constantly move around in the same areas and they don't mind each other at all because there's no danger and there's no threat from any of those animals. Oh, Soleil, uh, your answer's close. You're close. You're on the right track about what animals would be hiding in the water. So I was saying uh, they would hunt the animals. It's not alligators, Soleil, um, but very similar. It's crocodiles. Now, let me just get through here quickly. So, Soleil, in Africa, we don't have alligators, not at all. We only have crocodiles. Now, crocodiles tend to get a little bit bigger. And um, the Nile crocodile, which is the species that we find in Africa, very, very large, very powerful predators. And they would be lurking in that water, waiting for animals to come and drink that they can potentially ambush and try and catch. But, um, in this area and in that little dam where we were now, there are no crocodiles around there. But there are some other spots that do have crocodiles, some of the rivers and some of the bigger dams that have permanent water. So the animals do have to be careful. But very good guess, you were on the right track, so well done. <laughs> uh, Strawbridge, you'd like to know what time is it here? Now, we it's our afternoon and it is exactly, uh, well, it's, it's, it's almost 20 to 5 in the afternoon. So, almost 20 to 5 in the afternoon. And that is why it's so very, very warm. It's a beautiful afternoon, but it will start cooling down a little bit later as the sun starts dropping and setting. Hopefully we get a wonderful sunset for you this afternoon. Huh. 
<laughs> and Dina wants to know what I do for my job. What does it entail? Well, yeah, it's Safari Live, Dina. We take our afternoon, our morning and afternoon safaris, sunrise and sunset safaris, and we show the rest of the world what a live safari is like. I also have another job which I actually take people on safari. So people come out and they visit Africa and they want to go on a safari and look for animals and I take them and do that for them. So I'll drive them around in the game reserves, in the national parks or in the private game reserves and we look for animals and I teach them about nature, about wildlife and about, uh, about everything that we, we see out here. And then uh, help, hopefully help them get some wonderful photographs and memories of the animals that they see. Ah, everyone look at this. Look at this. Look at, look at this. I spoke about them earlier. Hang on a second. I'm just going to go around the corner. We're just speaking about the different antelope we get and have a look here. There's, there are impala as well as inyala, but there's the female inyala that I just showed you and with the younger one and then this one on the right hand side with the little horns, that is an impala. So we've got two different species of antelope. That goes back to, I think it was Ezekiel's question about how do the animals get along or which animals get along. And look at this, you know, we've got two different species of antelope together, happily feeding. And they don't mind each other at all. But there we go, we got to see the Inyala, that's wonderful, as well as the Impala. Look, that Impala's got some grass in its mouth. And Alice, you've just asked exactly what this antelope is doing. What do all of them eat? So Alice, we have antelopes, basically the antelope are, are categor or put into two categories, either um, grazers, which means they eat grass, just like this impala is doing at the moment, or browsers, which means that they feed off trees, leaves off trees. You also have mixed feeders, which is actually what the impala feeds, or what the impala is, which means they'll eat grass and the leaves off the trees, depending on the time of year. But the antelope, all antelope species, are only herbivores, which means they only eat plant material, so grass or leaves. Ah, lovely. Very nice to see them. Ah, wasn't that nice? Good to see the Inyala and the Impala together. Ah, uh, now, my very brave friend is still walking around. Let's head over to him and see what he's found. <laughs> there we go. Like I said to you, we're going to be looking at the smaller things. And there are two small things here. Firstly, this beautiful flower. And if I pick a leaf, I don't know if you can imagine feeling the softest kind of cotton that you've ever felt in your life. Imagine your softest clothes or maybe a blanket when you're really cold at night and the soft, snuggly feeling that that gives you. That's the same as this leaf. It's so soft and it's called a flannel weed because of that, because it feels like flannel. Then all of these flowers are sitting here and you might wonder to yourself why is it that they are this colour? Why would they be this colour? And it's not just to look pretty, it's because they attract different things that will come and take out the pollen. Can you see the pollen there? That's the yellow bit inside the yellow flower. And that pollen will be taken to another flower by things called vectors. Can you all say that? A vector. And the vector, in this case, is probably an ant. When we got here, I did see an ant crawling around on the flower, and I'm sure that there's another... Here we go, here we go. There's a little stingless bee. Look! Look, there's a little stingless bee there. Can you see it? That's a little bee, and it's pollinating, so maybe it's not ants, maybe it's pollinated by these little bees, tiny little bee. And Mrs. Jones's class, you ought to know what my favorite animal is, is that right? Well, I've got to tell you, 
my favorite animal is something called a wild dog and a wild dog is like the wolf of Africa but it looks like it's run through a paint factory it's covered in black and brown and white patterns and they're very very unusual so you can hardly see where the dog starts and where it begins and so that's my favorite animal and I like them because they're nice to each other many of the animals out here are not very nice to each other for example lions they're not nice to each other at all they fight all the time they never share their food they don't look after sick lions but the wild dogs they are fantastic they look after each other if there's an old one or a sick one or an injured one then they'll look after it and so that's why I like wild dogs very much Now, Mrs. Ward's class, you're wondering what is the most prevalent animal here. In other words, what animal most of? Well, you've already seen that animal, and it's called they have you. That is the most common animal. It is an antelope, which is a little bit like a deer, but not quite. We're just walking down quite a difficult spot here. So we're going to walk a little bit slower, and I'm going to show you something that many animals can't eat. Here. We have something called the marula, not the marula, the tambuti. Can you see that white? See that? That white stuff there is very, very poisonous. So if I was to eat, I'd probably throw up and I'd probably get quite bad diarrhea. But if you eat enough of it, it can actually kill you. So this is a poisonous plant and it's very important that even if you're not in the wilderness in Africa, if you go out into the wilderness where you live, you must be very careful of what you eat. Okay, it's very important that you don't just put anything in your mouth. Now, Byron has got some creatures that are a bit like me and you. Now this one's just hiding in the bushes, James, but I'm hoping it comes out soon. There are a few of them around. Just hang on everybody. They are a bit like you and me, or James and you, or <laughs> James and me. Let's see. Uh, it's not coming out there. Hang on. There's another few off to my right. And just over here, Brian, I wonder if you can see straight through there. Let's see if he stays still. There we go. It's a baboon, everybody. Look at that. <laughs> Wonderful. He's having a good look at us and a scratch. Oh, great. There they go. And they're foraging for food and baboons will eat just about anything. From plant material to fruit to insects. Even meat, if they manage to find it, they will. Uh, Mrs. Inches class, you would like to know what is the most dangerous animal on safari. Um, I'm just watching these baboons are moving off, it looks like it. Yeah, oh, there they go. Now, Mrs. Inches class, to be honest, it's very hard to say because generally animals, animals are not, what's the best way of putting this? And... I don't want to paint a bad picture about animals, but generally animals are not dangerous unless they feel threatened or they feel like they need to protect themselves. So generally animals would try to stay away from us and they would move away because to them we look like predators. So they're actually more scared of us than we are of them. However, if you were walking through the bush and you did come into a situation where you made an animal feel threatened, I'd say some of the more dangerous animals, or potentially dangerous animals, sorry there's a fly buzzing around me at the moment, <laughs> um, but I would say uh, probably hippo, hippopotamus, um, in the water because a lot of the time if people go down close to the water and, um, and they try and look for water or food close to, to those areas, the hippo are always around and maybe possibly feeding on the grass in the area and if they feel threatened they will protect themselves. They've got huge mouths, very big teeth and they can cause some serious damage. Listen, listen, 
You hear that? Let's see if they do that again. Those were the baboons, everyone. Listen. There we go. I wonder if they've seen something or if they're just busy alarm calling for maybe just shouting at one another. Isn't that an interesting sound? Bahu! Bahu! <laughs> A baboon. Um, other potentially dangerous animals would be crocodile. You're speaking about the hippo close to the water, the crocodiles too. Um, you know, lions and leopards, look, if they do feel threatened, if you do follow them and don't don't um, listen to their warnings or stay away from them, then you do, you do have to be very careful of those animals. But generally, in my experience, they do move away from you. Listen. Every now and then they give off the bark. Mrs. Interest Class, you also want to know what do crocodiles eat? Now, crocodiles will feed on um, on just about anything that comes down to drink. So any animal that comes down to drink at the water's edge could potentially be food for the crocodiles. They'll even feed on fish and that that they find in the water. I've seen that many times. Um, but anything that comes down to drink is potential food. So all the antelope species, I've even seen footage of, of crocodiles trying to catch elephant, which is obviously very, very difficult and highly unlikely. But I've seen them go for elephant when the trunk is in the water. But usually the crocodile gets thrown around a bit. <clears throat> but that does not happen often. Usually the crocodile realizes that that's too big for it and moves on. Anyway, let's continue. Strawbridge Elementary, you want to know <laughs> what what is the difference between a monkey and a baboon? So I'm gonna show you I'm gonna show you pictures of the two. So you can get an idea of they look different. The size is different, what they feed on is slightly different too. And I'm just gonna look for some shade so I can stop and show you properly. I'm still in search of other animals though. Hang on a second. Let's just see, oh, there's very little shade at the moment. <laughs> now the, the, the main difference between what they feed on, now baboons as I said will feed on just about anything from fruit, grass shoots, roots, and um, they'll even feed on other animals. I've seen big male baboons catch young impala lambs, so they do feed on meat too. Now, monkeys generally would feed on mostly insects and fruit, and a lot of fruit and grass shoots in that. So very different to the baboons. The baboons have a far wider range of food that they will feed on. I'm just gonna stop over here and I'll show you the difference in how they look. Now, the, um, the, the baboons are also much, much larger than monkeys. Now, in this area, we have those were the the um, uh, savanna baboon, or just we refer to them as baboons, the only baboon species we have in this area. And you see that? Very large baboons. You got to see them moving around. And then I'll just turn the page and show you what the vervet monkeys look like. Now these are the monkey species, or this is the monkey species that we see. Isn't that little one very cute? And these are much, much smaller. And I'll show you the size comparison shortly. But this is the vervet monkey, uh, much, much smaller than the, than the baboons. And look at those beautiful black faces. You can see the coloration is also different. These are almost a grayish color, light gray, very light underneath, whereas those baboons were that very dark gray. You can see the difference there, very, very dark brown gray color and much larger. So in terms of size, let me show you quickly. The baboons, some of the baboons, if they were sitting, a big male baboon sitting next to me would be, oh, it's a bit difficult to, I can't even, I can't get my arms that wide. So very big, about this size. If he was sitting next to me, even bigger. 
and then the vivid monkeys are only about that big yeah, maybe a big male is about that so half the size of a baboon if not smaller so they they much much smaller than the baboons right we're still in search of our leopards i haven't given up just yet hopefully we're going to find them at some point Maybe, maybe. Um, Brian says maybe the baboon was alarm calling at one of the leopards. You never know. It seems to have stopped now and is quiet. So maybe it just saw one walk in the distance. Who knows? I'm not too sure, but we're going to keep looking around, around this area. Uh, Soleil, I was chatting about the eagles earlier, and you've wanted to, know, or you want to know something about the eagles. Do we have bald eagles here? We don't, Soleil, not at all. But we do have an eagle that looks like a bald eagle. I'm going to show you a picture of one. I'll just get my book out. Now, the bald eagle is only found in North America, as far as I'm aware. Now, we don't have them out here. Oh, um, but like I said, we do have an eagle that looks like the bald eagle. Let me just see if I can find it for you quickly. I'm again going to stop in the shade. It's actually good to stop like this because what's hap what I do is I'll also listen if there are any, um, any alarm calls again, maybe from the baboon or from the antelope that are around this area. Maybe they spot the leopard before they do, before we do, and they can help us find them. Now, Soleil, getting back to your question, this, have a look at this. This is the African fish eagle. Now, do you see that? It looks, it looks similar to the bald eagle, but is not a bald eagle at all. That is the African fish eagle. So that looks similar, but it's a bit smaller um, and slightly different to the bald eagle. All right. All right. Now, thank you very much to all the kids from Lynn Haven and Strawbridge, all the classes watching. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you on Safari Live with us. We'll hopefully see you again soon. So goodbye, everybody. And we'll see you all on Safari Live soon. Synchalistinum. Ah. Hello, everybody. I think we're live with the drone. Right, there we are. You can see a 360 degree view there of the area to the southeast of the Gauri Repeater. It's one of the best views that you have here at Juma. And off to the far east you can see the vast expanse of the Greater Kruger National Park. And as Connor swings west, perhaps the mountain tops tipped with a little bit of cloud. As the wind starts to get up a little bit this afternoon, it is the most beautiful afternoon. And apparently there's a bird in view now. Now Connor has had some wonderful experiences with white-backed vultures and there's a bird apparently flying straight towards the drone. That's a little bit scary. The white-backed vultures tend to ignore the drone which is quite nice but the bataliers and eagles tend to get a little bit irritated with it so Connor's had to beat a hasty retreat every so often. I hope he's not having to do that now. Anyway, we've got some amazing shots of some vultures, so we will be publishing very soon a Safari Live story about the drone and you'll see some of the highlights, amazing shots that Connor's got of vultures in the air, as well as all of the aerial shots of where we operate and of course the amazing shots that he's got of those eagles sitting in trees. I have just spotted a jewel beetle. It's got nothing to do with anything you can see. <gasps> Come over here, everybody. Syncolostinum bracteosus. I'll explain that just now. Syncolostinum bracteosus. Judy H, that one's for you. Syncolostinum bracteosus. Can you see it there, Craigus? Just at the top there, there's a jewel beetle. A gorgeous, gorgeous jewel beetle shining in what is becoming the late afternoon sun. Gosh, that really is very special indeed.
Isn't he lovely? You got him there, Craig? Yeah. What kind of jewel beetle he is, I don't know. Has he flown off? He's gone around the side. He's gone around the side, has he? What a nasty blighter. Let me see. Can you still see him? Oh, I can just see him. Let me move around this way and see if I can't inspire him to come towards you. Come on, little jewel beetle. There we are. He should be back around now. You got him there. Yeah. Isn't that gorgeous? I think that's marvellous. Now, he was sitting at about eye level when we first came here. And I'm not sure what kind of jewel beetle he is, but he's very, very spectacular. Hmm, marvellous. Okay, Judy H. We have been talking about this wild basil plant, and I have found no reference to it being called wild, bas wild basil anywhere. Uh, but I did, however, find it in a book. And the book named it Syncorostinus. Bracteosis. Syncolostinus bracteosis. You wanted to know the Latin name, Judy H, and that's what it is. Syncolostinus bracteosis. It absolutely smells like basil, but I can't find any reference to it in a book, uh, and so we're just going to call it Syncolostinus bracteosis. And in order to um, remember that, of course, uh, I will have to say it repeatedly throughout the drive, Syncolostinus bracteosis. On we go. Goodbye, jewel beetle. And do remember the name of this plant. It is Syncolostinus Bracteosis. Excellent. On we go. Herbert, what's this plant called? That's it. Syncolostinus bracteosis. Herbert and I have both been struggling immensely to remember the name of this plant during the course of the walk. And we've now said it each 384 times. Now we're heading down this way because there are some pans not too far from here. It is a hot afternoon, uh, sitting at about 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Whew. And with any luck there'll be something coming down to drink. That cross little elephant who's been knocking about to quarantine clearings, um, well, we did see him at the very beginning of the drive and then he disappeared. And I think he's gone in search of some marulas. And perhaps he will pop back towards quarantine clearings towards the evening to chase his wildebeest herd that he doesn't seem to, well, he seems to play with him quite a lot. What have you got there, Herbert? Herbert has found a leaf. Now, whether he is gathering this for supper or whether he wishes to tell us something about it, I cannot be sure. What do you wish to tell us, Herbert? Just want to make something. You want to make something? Yes. Uh, one okay. <laughs> he says, I must carry on waffling. He's going to make something. That's excellent. Okay, well, we'll let Herbert make his thing and we'll talk about some grasses in the meantime. Oh! You see, every time you stop, there's something amazing. Just watch the end of this spike here. There's another bee, or a fly, no, it's a fly. You see the fly there? Mm. It's just, it's landed on the edge of one of the branches here. Oh, it's flown off. No, it hasn't. It's still there. It's one of these hovering flies. Can you see the end of the grass? Mm. Okay, here's the grass. I'm going to just let you follow the grass in. You following it? Yeah. Okay, follow the grass. Now the grass is going to go to the right. And on the branch to the right of this one is the little fly. You got him. You got him there? Yeah, there you go. Well done. But I can't you can't quite get him. Yeah. There we are. Well done. Now that little fly, everybody, is a hover fly. It's a hovering fly. I know it's a fly because it's only got two sets of wings. Sorry, two wings. So it's only got the four wings. The hind wings are much smaller and almost totally vestigial. In other words, they're not used really for flight. And all the flies have only got two useful wings. And this one looks quite old because its wings are in some state. They look like they've been lacerated. What a gorgeous little fly. Black and white and with a long proboscis I think that it probably uses to eat uh, nectar. Must be. That is astounding. Now, oh, come over here. 
Tony, while we wait to see what Herbert has set up for us here, I'm deeply suspicious. You say, somebody said jewel beetles were used as jewels. How do they preserve them? Um, it, they keep the elytra, they keep the exoskeleton. So basically you would, um, I suppose, stick something like a hypodermic needle up into it and then suck the guts out. Otherwise, you just let them dry in the sun and eventually the guts kind of either evaporates or I don't know what happens to it or they go hard, basically and they're entirely uh, preservable. They, go, they don't smell bad, and I suppose you could put them on a necklace if you so wished. Right, Herbert, what are we looking at here? Or you, is it a trap? Pick it up. All right, now Herbert has told me that he's not telling us, that it's you and me, what this is. I'm going to show it to you. And it's a plant called the mother-in-law's tongue. And the mother-in-law's tongue here has been somehow employed to make a device of some sort. What device this is, Herbert, I hope, is going to tell us. If you would like to know what this device is, well, he would insist that you have a guess. So hashtag Safari Live. Tell us what you think this is. And Herbert will tell us in about 10 minutes. 10 minutes he'll tell us. Apparently that's the angle at which it is used. Um, maybe it's a tray to carry marula fruits. I don't know. In ten minutes we'll find out. We'll carry on. I'll keep it with me. Thank you, Herbert, for making me look like an idiot in front of all of our, of all of our viewers. <laughs> right. Byron is still in search of a heartbeat. I'm going to ponder the inexorable mysteries of what it is that Herbert has constructed. Send through your answers, hashtag Safari Live, and while you think about it, you can chat to Byron. And while James is pondering away, we are still searching. And no luck just yet, but it is still warm. And I think, it, you know, as I always say, it's too soon to panic. It's a warm afternoon. If these leopards are around, they're probably lying in the shade somewhere. So what we're going to do is we're going to move out the area, search for other animals, and, and then uh, come back a little bit later. But I've had no sign of them at all yet. And that's again just assuming that they're still in the area. They could possibly have moved off. Especially if the kill is finished, gone in, gone in search for water. But at the moment, because of all the rain we've had, there's water everywhere. There are lovely little pans and little ponds. Ah, now speaking of water and animals at water, Taylor's got huge animals in the water to show you. Have a look at this. We have got a herd of elephants who are swimming. It is a hot day. This is what we were hoping for. Isn't this amazing? I haven't seen swimming elephants since I've started working here. And you can see, David, the ones on the left. The, sorry, no, the two. There's two actually wrestling. Can you see them in the middle? There we go. Just in front of the big one. Those two over there are wrestling each other. The smaller one that's closest to us is trying to push most likely its older sibling around. Mm. And they love water. That every single time I see elephants in water, it are, well, they are the happiest. Now we're at a little pan, I have no idea what it's called, but we're just on the boundary of Gauri, Maine. And we're just in Chitwa. I'm not sure what this little pan is called. But look how excited they are. Now they're running out. Someone's obviously told them they have to leave now. Hello guys, something's given them a bit of a fright. You can hear them all trumpeting. They're a little bit unsettled. I'm not sure what has startled them like this. Because they were very, very happy in here. But as quick as they were swimming around and having the time of their life, they're now moving across the road and off they go. Short and sweet, I suppose. And there's a number of them now. That's a lovely herd, eh, David? How many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
I think there's about 10 or 11 elephants here. It's a lovely and a normal size breeding herd of elephants. But how crazy is that? As quick as that happened, they're now off. They seem to be changing direction. I think they're going to cross back out into Gauri, Maine. Let's reverse. Let's see if we can get another look at them. Now that's quite bizarre that they've moved away like that because they were very happy in the water, splashing around, swimming. Whether one of them picked up the scent or something that they were, well, they didn't quite like, maybe they heard something and the matriarch sort of said, no, no, we're not hanging around here anymore. We better get going. And that's a pity because they were having an absolute ball of a time. But let's see if we can catch them just over here. They look like they might come and out and cross over the road again. Like I said, we're, we're sort of between Torchwood now and uh, Chitwa Chitwa. I just need to jump onto the radio very quickly. My brothers and Glove have now moved away from the pan and are mobile in an easy direction parallel just in uh, Chitwa, just from Chitwa driveway, uh, parallel with Gauri Main. It's just myself here. There's about 11 in Lovu. Here they are. And they're coming towards us very, very slowly. And look, now they look all settled again. And it's very good that they do swim, especially on hot days like this, and, and especially after all of the rain because all the insect populations would have been booming as well. So there's lots of ticks around at the moment. We're all being bitten by pepper ticks. And by covering themselves in mud, not only does it keep them nice and cool, but it also suffocates all of those ectoparasites that could be, well, attempting to feast on the blood of these elephants. And they'll be picking them up through all of the long grass. And also those biting flies are terrible at this time of the year. Now I'm looking around just trying to see who else is here and you can still see they're a little bit on edge, they're still moving quickly out of the area and, and Zoe, hello to you actually asking this afternoon, could it have perhaps been that there's a rowdy elephant bull um, maybe in the area? Definitely, 110% there could be a big bull and must and we have seen a bull and must around this area so it's quite possible and that would definitely be enough to start these elephants because a bull and must is a big boisterous boy and well he'll push all of the little ones around and obviously the female elephants don't enjoy that one little bit. Hello girl. You can see she's just smelling us. You see how she's twisted her trunk. She's tilting her head towards us. It's okay big girl. What are you picking up? She's smelling she keeps twisting her trunk around though. She's she's definitely smelling something whether it's us now she's changing direction. Look, look, look how panicked they all are getting again. That little calf is trying to suckle. That is the equivalent of a child throwing a tantrum in the shopping market when mom says no to sweets. That's basically what mom is saying to that little elephant, is saying no, you are too old to suckle, that's for your younger sibling. But it's actually taking a chance. Very sneaky little elephant. So that was just an unhappy youngster. But normally elephants don't make too much noise. They do a bit of rumbling here and there, of course, for communication. And a lot of it we aren't able to hear because they're communicating mainly through infrasound. So these low, very, very low rumblings. And they've got sensory sort of nerves in their feet, so they're able to hear it. They'll pick up those vibrations through the ground and then they're able to translate it to, well, what they can understand. But I wonder if they come across another little pan, if they'll pop on into it, because I don't think that they were quite finished with their little bath that they were having. Sometimes elephants will spend an hour swimming around. But I don't know if there's going to be much water left in that pan after these ellies had gotten hold of it. And I wish that they would go and swim in twin dams because that's such a beautiful big pan now and I think it would have quite a nice amount of water in. But off they go. They're now disappearing far into the thicket. And unfortunately there are no roads that I think we're going to be able to catch up with them on. Wasn't that amazing? That was really lovely, I think. 
and I'm glad we got to see them swimming as quick as what it was. I'm sure that's all put a smile on your face. David and I are grinning from ear to ear. But we're going to head back onto Juma and we're going to keep checking the watering holes. And while we do that, let's go across to Byron and see if he's having any luck with those spotted cats. That's lovely, Taylor. Well done. So nice to, nice to see those elephants playing in the water. Oh, hang on. Sit, sit. Uh, there's a cuckoo, everyone. It looked like a cuckoo and I just saw a quick glimpse of it. Hold on. Let's see, let's see, did it sit? It may also have been a wood hoopoo. No. Oh, you know what it is? There it goes. It's a scimitar bull. Oh dear, it just flew off. I'll show you a picture of one quickly. It was a scimitar bull, common scimitar bull. Let me show you a nice picture of one. Uh, we're still in search of, uh, of the... Um, of any leopard activity or any big cats for that matter no luck just yet but uh, but we're driving around now seeing what else we can find I was hoping to find elephant I'm actually very jealous that Taylor found those elephant but whatever <laughs> um, let, let me just show you that symmetrical quickly common symmetrical there we go let me show you there we go. that's it beautiful bird I just caught a glimpse of it flying and saw those that white barring under the tail looked almost like a cuckoo that was flying but it's a scimitar bull very different look at that long curved beak it helps it to catch insects beautiful bird so that was nice to see just a quick glimpse of it they, um, they're not usually in big flocks usually one or two flying around um, and that was a solitary one I don't see any others around and they um, they were f just flying off there. Nice to see that one. And some white browed scrub robins, very melodious call all around at the moment. A lot of them in this area. And it's James's favourite call, or one of James's favourite. Lauren, you know we don't have or. Actually, we do have ostriches in the Greater Kruger area. Um, I haven't seen an ostrich on Juma yet. Not yet, but we do get them occasionally. And I know down on Cheetah Plains, I think there have been ostriches seen down there. But um, I haven't seen an ostrich here yet. Not while I've been at Safari Live. Um, but I have seen in this great, or in the Sabi Sands, in fact, I've seen ostriches just south on Londolozi. I saw a few ostriches down there. So. We do get them in the area and occasionally they do come through, but uh, I haven't seen one on Juma yet. A woodland kingfishers calling in the distance too. Now, while I'm in search of larger animals um, or birds, James has found a small winged creature. Let's see what it is. It's a yellow pansy and it's just posing so nicely at the moment. It's having a drink at this little watering hole for butterflies. And I can see a small elephant dung, so also for elephant dungs. At least for small elephants, not elephant dungs. But it's a little microcosm, a little beautiful um, sort of patch of coolth, I suppose, in the heat. A tiny little water hole about, oh, I don't know, about three feet wide by two feet. And in it there are butterflies and water boatmen and little water beetles and algae and possibly a tiny terrapin or two. And this tiny little patch of coolth and moisture has created an entirely sort of... Uh, self-sufficient ecosystem if you like which I think is quite sweet uh, Scott you were absolutely correct this is a flip-flop it is a child's flip-flop it is a brilliant composition and it can also be used if you happen to tick fight as a small child that is brilliant stuff uh, I think Uh, 
Okay. Uh, dear, uh, what tracks have we got here? Yeah, hang on a second. What was that? Oh, welcome back. I've just seen some tracks here. Give me a second. Let's see what this is. It is a ah, it is a misi, which is the Shangan word for hyena. It was a hyena track that we saw. And looks like it looks like actually from last night. Walked all along the road here. Just double checking myself. I don't want to miss anything. Definitely a hyena track. Um, unfortunately, it's not very clear. I would have liked to have shown it to you, but it's in some soft sand. So you often just see like this bit of a, a, a smudge of a track, and it's not as clear, but. Uh, Generally, if you've been tracking for a while, you can tell a hyena track very, uh, very easily, and you can recognize it very easily, rather, as opposed to any of the big cats like lion or leopard. Let's see if we can find some interesting birds around here. I'm looking, scanning the trees to see if there's any bird of prey that we might be able to see. Don't see anything just yet. Some beautiful big trees. You know what we should actually do? Let's also try to find some ripe marulas. Let's see if we can find some ripe marulas. I'm going to look around, get some vitamin C, get some more energy. I think. Do they give you energy? I don't know. Maybe it's all a mind game. Oh, stop. Hang on. There's a beautiful lilac breasted roller, everyone. Let's see if he has stopped for us. No, there he goes. Hang on. Oh, he's sitting at the top of this dead branch. Give me a second. I hope he doesn't fly. You might get a glimpse of... Oh, no, there he flies. Sit there. Sit in the sun. Oh, oh no. He couldn't land there. <laughs> he, he, he flew into the tree and couldn't land. Oh, dear. Where did he go? He's gone. Unfortunately, a lilac breasted roller. Now just have a look at these doves in the road everyone and Hooray, I'll get to your question now about the biggest birds in the area. But have a look at those beautiful Cape turtle doves. Now this always reminds me, whenever I see them in the road and flying straight down the road like this, it reminds me of my good friend Judas, who was a tracker that I used to work with. We spent about five years working together. And the reason why it reminds me of him is because whenever we were driving guests, and he'd be sitting on the front of the vehicle and we'd see Cape turtle doves in the road. And then what they would do is either walk straight in front of us or fly straight down the road in front of us for a while and then veer off somewhere. And whenever that happened, he would say, oh, that's very good luck. We're probably going to have a good sighting. So let's see there. And you see they're flying straight down the road and then they veer off. Who knows? Maybe it's good luck. Let's see. Now, Ren, getting back to your question about the largest birds in the area. And uh, you're right, the Marshall Eagle. Did you see something? A black bellied bastard. Oh, there he is. Well spotted, Brian. Let's have a look. There's a bird on the ground. There it is. Moving through there. Looks like a female black bellied bastard. Um, now, um, getting back to the question on the largest birds in the area, and as that Buster disappears in the grass. Lovely to see it. They're well spotted, Brian. The Marshall Eagles are one of the largest in the area. But then, of course, you've got vultures, which are bigger. Uh, marabou storks, which are much larger. Uh, Goliath herons. All of those birds are, are much, much larger, much taller. But the, in terms of the wingspan, and that uh, vultures would probably have the largest wingspan, the leopard faced vulture. Now, that is probably one of the largest. Now, I'm just trying to think. Um, now, for the life of me, I can't remember. I'm going to quickly have a look at something. Um, I'm just trying to think if I've seen a quarry busted in this area. And I can't remember. Just give me a second. I'll show you what the quarry busted looks like. It's the heaviest flying bird in Africa. It's huge, massive. Um, let's see if I can find it and show you a picture of it. And I'm just trying to think. I, I know I definitely haven't seen it um, in this area or in Juma, but 
Um, but I did, I have seen on uh, on Londolozi, so just south of here. Now this is the Cory Bustard. Have a look at that bird. Let's see, hopefully the, is the light okay, Brian? There we go. Now look at that. Now that is the heaviest flying bird. And I'll give you the weight shortly, but it is very, very big. And it has a huge wingspan. Oh, that is a beautiful bird, the Cory Bustard. And let me just show you quickly. Um, let me quickly get the weight for you, but almost 13 kilograms male, so over 12 kilograms, which is what's that 30 pounds about? About 30, what's it? No, kilograms. Yeah, it's about 30 pounds or so, call it that, somewhere around there. Now, if I was, let me just try to stretch here quickly. If it, if I was next to the Cory Bustard and it was on the dash, or actually just below the dash, so if my hand is over there, that Cory Bustard is probably about this tall. It's a huge bird, heaviest flying bird, and we do get them, we do see them occasionally in the area. I have seen in the Sabi Sands before. Sure. It is scorching. Very, very hot afternoon. Now, some of my friends all over the world, uh, especially up in the United States, I know some of you are getting snow at the moment. Some friends in Chicago are getting snow this morning. Uh, I, I must be honest, I'm a little jealous. I, I, okay, I love this wonderful warmth that we have, but we're not used to snow, so hopefully at some point I'll get to see some snow again. I've only seen snow once, proper snow, and that was very young in, in Europe. Um, never been skiing though, so that's on my bucket list. I wonder if I'd be able to find any wildlife while I'm skiing. Okay, now, and Taylor has um, left that area, I think, where the elephant are, but let's see where she is and what she's found. <laughs> Byron, don't worry about us. We're not getting ourselves lost today. We are on our way towards Biffles Hook Dam, and we're not too far away now. I can, I'm starting to see the big dead trees in the far distance, which must mean that we are getting closer and I'm hoping we're going to be well as lucky as what we were when we were at that previous pan with all those swimming elephants but I'm not sure what we're going to see David has said that we're probably going to see some terrapins and I have a, a strong feeling that he's probably correct I think the largest population of terrapins on the Sabi sand actually lives in Bivol's Hook Dam there's always these tiny little heads just poking out of the water and well, swimming around each other. But we'll only, well, I suppose we'll only really find out when we get there. But I would say that marabou stalk that I was telling you about the other day has come back. That would be quite nice. And uh, I believe that they have found the Nkuhumas again. I just want to keep you all updated. They're still in the same place as they were this morning, just east of Sydney's Dam and Biffles Hook. So, Ooh. So Mike has said to me, he's there now, and if they do get up and start coming south, he is going to let us, of course, know. And hopefully they do. Hopefully it cools down quickly this evening, and they do decide to come back this way. It's hard at the moment for the lions. We're almost at the dam, just because there's not a lot of buffalo around, and, well, something like a kudu is not really going to keep them going for too long. Alright, we're almost here, we're almost here, here we are, we're going to just find a nice spot to look out at, we'll go around to that, oh, just, we just went through a spider web, that was a strong one, did you feel that one David? Didn't, oh, did I get it for you? You did see it, yeah, it almost choked me, it was so, the spider web was so strong, but we are going, we're almost here, like I said, we're going to just choose a nice little point and then we'll have a better look. We'll hopefully be able to see some really amazing animals. Is there anything here? Check and make sure that it's safe. Looks safe. Here we are. There's the terrapins. Hi 
Hello, John Vessels. You're wanting to know what are the water levels like at the moment? Are they dry? Are they full? Are they running? Well, unfortunately, Biffles Hook Dam, as you look at these terrapins, you can see the water level. You can see that even their shells are sticking out of the back, out of the top of the water, sorry. So they're not, it's not great. And unfortunately, these pans don't seem to hold water very well. It seems to seep away quite quickly because I reckon in another, hmm, maybe another week or so, if we don't get any more rain, I think that this pan is going to empty out. But that's also got to do with the exceptional hot weather that we have had at the moment. Here we go. All the little turban heads. I think it's James trying to talk to me. Let me quickly just see if I can chat. No, they're not looking for me. They're looking for Byron. Right, we're going to go back across to James, who's got a spotted cat. Now I'm jumping on the radio very quickly. Let me see. Right, so I'm just trying to find out. Byron, Byron, I'm trying to talk on the radio now. Byron's stealing my radio time. Byron, I think it's got to do with an ingwe. I'm on Inyala Road North now. I think there's somewhere around here. I'm just quickly just trying to organize what's going on. Fantastic. So it seems as though, and I apologize that you had to uh, run away from James, but unfortunately the signal on Inyala Road South can be a little bit sketchy, filled with uh, gremlins. But we're going to attempt and see. I think we could have better signal with the, uh, well, the big aerial that we have. So we're going to race down, run Inyala Road North now. James has said we need to get towards Inyala Road South. Let me let him know. Uh, Herbert, if you copy, I'm on Inyala Road North. I'm coming south now. Just gonna let them know that we're on our way. How exciting is this? I don't know who they found. Maybe it's Karula? I hope it is. That'll be fun, especially after seeing her a darling little cubs this morning. Right, so we're not far. Yeah, the only problem is, is that this road is a little bit bumpy still, unfortunately. Because it goes down and through these uh, drainage systems, when it does rain quite a bit, it falls victim to erosion quite badly. Now, I was trying to get hold of Herbert, but I can't, it does, he doesn't seem to be responding, so maybe he's in a bit of a dip. Um, be, well, because of course, and because of course, uh, they might be low down in this drain. So sorry, I think the gremlins are attacking Taylor. She's got a bit of a signal issue there. She's going, it's sometimes difficult. We find little patches where as soon as you hit a small little dip where the signal just jumps around a bit. But let's see. What is that? Am I seeing things? What is that? Oh, it's a stump, everyone. <laughs> well, you know. You gotta be good to find a stump out here. <laughs> um, anyway, we've come to the clearings. I'm having a look around, but I'm heading towards Juma Dam. And again, just the, the heat of the day, I, I like to go and check these water holes and dams because hopefully you can get animals that are down drinking or, um, or wondering about the clearings. So let's see. still very very warm and like I said I think you know we saw earlier those Impala and Inyala that we saw earlier in the drive they were all in the dense thickets they were in the shade out of the sun out of the heat and that's probably better for most of these animals and where most animals are at the moment unless they're drinking at some of the water holes but as we said also remember there's lots of water around so they can get water anywhere which is good I'm still looking for some nice marula or marulas so Brian and I may have a little snack, a bush snack. Uh, 
and this morning we're doing a bit a few flowers on uh, on our bush walk and I must apologize I, I got uh, some of the information a little bit wrong or incorrect um, the uh, the foxglove which we get out in this area um, does not contain the digitalin that I thought it did that is a foxglove which I think is found in Europe and that's what I managed to find out but uh, it's a very uh, same species or, or family foxglove family but the one that we get out here apparently does not does not contain the the digitalin that I was thinking which is which is poisonous for us and there goes a little tree squirrel isn't that cute nice to see them running around uh, Emery wanted to know what is my favorite plant to eat um, oh dear plant you know what is tasty actually and and I don't mind eating it and I think if I was stuck out here um, and I had a bit of salad dressing perhaps I would I would go and pick the leaves of the buffalo thorn and those those leaves really are tasty they're quite crunchy crisp sweet um, and especially now this time of year the leaves are very nice to eat so I'd happily feed or <laughs> get a feed on I'd happily eat the leaves of the buffalo thorn tree they're very very nice and tasty um, but of course marula marula's or marula fruit at least that would win another one that I, I've tasted a few times and I, I'm still indecisive of whether or not I enjoy it and it is the sour plum now it really does not get the name sour plum for no reason it is incredibly sour and uh, the funny thing is and um, I, I, I don't I obviously would never do this but some guides give it to their guests and they see the funny faces they pull when they bite into this very very sour fruit um, as I said I mean I would never do that but <laughs> it is very entertaining to see and um, and they, uh, they they are tasty but but uh, but very very sour very sour Hopefully we'll find some. I haven't seen any yet. Maybe later in the month, towards the end of the month or in February, we might start seeing some ripe sour plums. Beautiful red fruit like this, about that size, and um, quite tasty. Okay, I'm not far from the from the waterhole from Juma Dam. So uh, let's have a we'll have a look around in that area and see what we can find. Maybe there's some animals down there. <laughs> Speaking of of uh, food to eat in the bush. <laughs> A friend of mine, another guide, a local guide, he lives in, in a, a village or comes from a village not far from here. Um, incredible personality, very, very funny. And some of our guests, uh, and I'm not sure if Christine or Teresa or any of you are watching at the moment, they always drive with Elfie. And uh, hang on a second, James has got something interesting he'd like to show you. Go to him quickly. We think this is Karula. Just moving up through there, wonderful sighting we've had, and I'm sorry about the picture. Well, we're just going to move slowly through here, and we're trying to get Taylor into the sighting, but it is really a difficult, difficult part of the reserve to be in. Craig is about 25 feet tall at the moment, so it's very difficult for him to move through here. There, 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 there. there going to come up onto Batelier Road now. Um, I think you got her. She's run up a little bit towards the road there. Craig, Craig. So what she's done everyone, I don't know if you actually managed to see her at all. She moved up the road there. And I don't know if this is Karula. It, I'm pretty sure it must be. But I got a very brief view. But Karula doesn't normally react like this on foot. She normally is very relaxed. But we have now been kind of following her, so she might just 
to us. Put. I think you can turn it up. And if. I'm just going to try and get another view. It's the most impossible area to get a view or get a vehicle into. She went up there, hey? Now, Batelier Road is just through those thickets there. Yeah, I can hear her coming. I can hear Taylor's vehicle coming. We're going to wait here. Taylor, I can hear you. Just keep coming on Batelier. There's a thicket of Tambuertis with a game path coming out of them. Just about probably 300 meters in front of you. She's gone towards that. Well, let's try for one more view. Should we try once more? Well, the trick here is to just walk quietly and normally and hope that she doesn't react in an adverse fashion. And I suppose there must be some of you wondering, is this dangerous? Well, it would be if she had cubs. That's the, ro that's the little road she took up there. It would be if she had cubs and if she was cornered, but obviously she's not cornered, she's not with cubs. So it's probably relatively safe. Keep coming, Taylor, and you can see, I mean, although this is the Prince of Cats, James, James, predator. Yeah, affirmative, keep coming. Yes. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, that's where she is. She's where those birds are alarming. They're birds alarm calling just over there. Yeah, now Taylor's right there. Herbert said he thought he saw her. Isn't this exciting? Taylor, any luck there? Taylor's got it. Uh, I don't see her anymore, okay. but she's. Right, we've just, I've just got a very quick glimpse of Karula. I'm going to try and go in. She's in this thicket and there's a magpie shrike. I think it's a magpie shrike that was shouting away at her. Yes, it was a magpie shrike. So we're going to get her now. You can still hear the bird is very much alarming away, but it's exceptionally thick. Now I'm just making sure, have you got her? There she is. Oh, there she goes. Beautiful. Madam Karula. She looks like she's hunting. Now we're gonna have to try and keep up with her, David. Are you ready? We're gonna have to do some. Ah, so James is not sure if it is Karula. Oh. We just gotta go over this little shrub here. Wait, no. It's exceptionally thick. Now, Roger, you're wondering if it... Ooh, watch your heads, David, you good? Um, wondering if it is shadow. I'm not sure. I've seen this leopard's bum, so we're going to have to wait until we get it to confirm. But Karula does like this area. I, here she goes. This leopard is now sitting down. Let's have a... We'll have a look here. It is Karula. It is definitely Karula. You can see the big W on her head. And you can spot that straight away. Come on, look towards us. But I'm almost certain, yes, and that snarl is oh so Karula, isn't it? But there's a couple of birds that are also flying ahead and that are watching down on her, so we might get them alarming. But finally, after a very, very long time, we have managed to get this leopard. So very well done to James, Herbert and Craig. Fantastic work from the three of you. And she's hot. She's tired. The sun is baking down on her. But we know Karula. Karula doesn't mind the heat too much. She often likes to move during the day. 
And one of those reasons would be, especially when she was moving her cubs, she used to move them to avoid the other apex predators that would most likely be resting on, well, during the, the predominant heat of the day. But my favourite leopard of all time, Lisbon, who I've spoken about many times, who roamed the southwestern corner of the Sabi Sand. And, well, she used to do the same thing as Karula. She used to do most of her hunting during the middle of the day. And I think she was very clever by doing that because there weren't too many predators out and about. So she was almost utilizing a window where she had a better chance of perhaps catching something. She'd use a lot more energy though because she'd be out in the heat of the day. And you know that these leopards sometimes have to walk miles before they even pick up on a prey species. But she's just having a little rest for the moment and I hope that she doesn't decide to go through some of this thicker vegetation into the Tumbuerti thickets because then that is going to be very interesting to try and follow her. What are you doing girl? Catching flies. But what a beautiful leopard. I haven't seen her in such a long time. It's so lovely to see her. Hey beautiful girl. Well, it's good to see that she's still coming back, and I wonder where her cubs are now. I wonder if they cross the road from the south, or if she's maybe left them on the safety of the termite mound uh, that they were f hiding on this morning from those hyenas. Is definitely a possibility. <laughs> and now she's done enough walking for the day, well, for the moment at least. She's just going to have a little cat nap. She hasn't really chosen a good spot, of course, to hide away from the sun. Hello, Daniel. Daniel, I'm so sad that you missed the, the sighting this morning that we had, of course, with gorilla's cubs and the hyenas. Now, Daniel, you're wondering what basically happened in that sighting. So we we driven past where uh, Hosanna was found by James in the, in the evening, and he wasn't there. And we knew exactly where he was sitting. And then we did a quick loop because we saw some hyenas running through, so we thought we'd try and catch up with them. And then we decided, okay, let's go past one more time. And as we came past the second time, he came out of the bushes and he was sitting in this, exactly the same spot. Then the hyenas that David and I were trying to chase after came back across from Duma and um, back towards sort of a little gallery. And, and then basically Shongila came out. She was on the termite mine resting. She we decided to go up a very small tree, a bush willow, and then Hosanna just ran and as was sort of seeking shelter again up on the termite mound, just watching in the distance, as well as Karula is now watching us. But nothing happened. They were safe and sound. I think those hyenas picked up the scraps from whatever they were eating yesterday. We saw Hosanna had a big fat belly. So we know that he had a good feast. So maybe Karula caught a young impala, which she seems to be of catching a lot of um, lately. And I think, and you know what Shongile and Hosanna are like, they play around with their carcass so much that if Karula had taken it up in the tree, they could have easily dropped it out. And then I think that those hyenas snatched it up. And well, now she's off looking for her next meal for her, her lovely children. fast asleep and hopefully she does catch something for us today that would be really nice now speaking of her beautiful cubs uh, in case you are a new viewer and you're not sure about how old Karula's cubs are hopefully we'll be able to show you them but they're 11 months old and Shannon you're actually wondering what would happen to Karula's cubs if she were to fall pregnant now um, I don't think too much they just eventually in about three months or so they'd get pushed out. So she wouldn't want them around anymore. So even young Shongile would have to go off on her own, but they're, they're old enough, they'll be fine. They know how to catch tortoises. They know how to catch small birds and squirrels and, and dwarf mongoose, and they'll grow so quickly. Um, so I'm not really worried about that. If something were to, well, something like that were to happen, uh, they would be fine. They would just move off, but they, and then by the time that she would even have cubs, they'd be over a year. Nah, no, they'll be okay. These cats are tough, but Karula is notorious, uh, and obviously I've just uh, heard this via the grapevine, is that she does seem to keep her cubs for a, an extended period of time. Oh, she's looking around again. I need to prepare myself 
because if she decides to go into the wall of trees that is just behind her, I don't know how we're going to try and keep up with her. And she's not. Who are you snarling at? You better not be snarling at us, young lady. But the, she's got beautiful teeth, though, as you can see, nice and yellow. She she obviously doesn't use a whitening toothpaste. Hey? Very yellow teeth. No, I'm just teasing. They don't need to use toothpaste, of course. That's just natural um, sort of staining on their teeth, and that can often help you identify uh, their age. Well, she's not a particularly young girl anymore. She's got lots of life experience now. Hey, big girl. Come on, catch a steer and balk for us. I'm sure there's a lot of them around at the moment. Now we're going to try and stick with Karula for a little bit longer. I need to try and guide some of the other rangers into the sighting. But let's go back across to James, who's wandering around on foot, and he's got something with wings, but it's not a bird. So from the Prince of Cats we go to the Monarch of the Skies. Isn't that a neat link? Those two monarch butterflies caught as the great spotted cuckoo were yesterday evening in flagrante delicto. Caught in the act. And what they are doing is making new monarch butterflies which they will shortly lay on either, or the eggs they will lay either on um, milkweed plants or that very latexy disgusting thing we found the other day with a monarch larva on it. Now um, I just want to say to you that that was a profoundly wonderful experience we had. Let me just get out of the sun so I don't, we don't blind you and maybe the monarchs will stay there for a little bit longer. Um, let me tell you how it unfolded because we couldn't get any signal when we first found her. We were walking down the road there same road where you lost signal, where we were carrying the uh, the slip slop uh, made from the mother-in-law's tongue, and we found lion tracks from this morning. And if you were on the drive this morning, you'll know that I was trying to track the Styx Pride, and they crossed into Torchwood. This is where they lay down sometime during the night around here. And we were walking along the road, and Herbert was telling us about an elephant incident. And suddenly we looked down, and we saw these leopard tracks, and I thought they looked like they're steaming fresh. And he said to me, I think we've disturbed her. I think we've seen this into the drainage line. So we walked down into the drainage. That's this little drainage line here. And Herbert went along the drainage. And he, because Craig's got this very great aerial coming out the back of him, we just walked along the side and Herbert was in. And I was checking the pans to see if she hadn't popped out again, perhaps to have a drink. And Herbert suddenly went, hey, hey. She'd been sleeping on the bottom of the drainage, probably watching us, and Herbert almost stood on her tail. And because she's Karul and because she's used to us, she just kind of got up and moved. And then when you came to us, you tried to come to us again. We just found her again, and she was there. We could just see her ears sticking up out of, over the grass. She knew we were there. She was completely ignoring us, and she was just kind of looking off into the bushes. There'd been a herd of Nyala around there. And she moved a bit. She sat up, and she looked at me, and I, this is just the best thing. So she was I don't know, 20 feet of her old and she looked and she stretched and she turned around and she just looked at me like this, as if to say, how dare you? And I stood and froze and then she moved off and then you came to us again as we picked her up again and she disappeared and we called tail around on this road and the rest, as they say, is history. And although the view for us wasn't great, the view for you wasn't great when, with us on foot, it's just so exciting to find a leopard like that on foot, especially one that is so very special to us, it is an astounding and wonderful Thursday afternoon's work, I have to say. Let's see how our butterflies are doing. They still seem to be uh, at it, as it were. They're being very confiding indeed. And one of the nice things you can see here about them is that they are definitely monarchs as opposed to diadems. Now, the diadem is a mimic of the monarch butterfly. The male, however, doesn't look anything like a monarch. The male is black and purple and white. And the female looks almost exactly like the monarchs, but for the fact that she only has one spot on her hind wing. Now, you can see the spots there on those monarchs. And where there are four or five of them there, there is only one on the diadem. Oh, they're getting shaken around a bit by the wind. 
swinging from the chandeliers, I think, is the term that we use. <laughs> Yeah, you see, Ote, you say, would I ever get tired of tracking that experience of tracking leopard on foot? No, I don't think I would. For me, it's, you know, the actual process of tracking for me is quite frustrating. I don't have the eyes for it. My eyes are, they don't see 3D in the same way that most people do. And so for me to actually see a track on the ground, is, unless it's fresh like these ones were, is quite difficult. And I find the process, because I'm also slightly attention deficit um, disordered, I find the process of tracking um, the actual tracks foot by foot fairly frustrating. But I will never ever get tired of being on foot with a completely wild animal who has chosen to accept me into their space. That for me is, is one of the only reasons I live out here. Not the only reasons, it's one of the most important reasons I live out here. I live out here for obviously because it's a beautiful place and there are lovely smells and sights and clean air and all that sort of thing but that touch from a wild animal accepting you saying to you okay I know you're there I see you and I will tolerate you in and around me even though I'm a completely wild and unhabituated and undomesticated animal I'll, I'll have you in my space I'll deal with you I trust you enough for that I'll never ever get sick of that it's just a uh, I don't know, there's something profound about it for me. And I think it's it's one of the main reasons that I've remained in this industry for so long. Isn't that great? Okay, we're going to leave these chaps. They need a little bit of privacy. Let's carry on. Right, let's find out what Byron's doing, see if he too has had a profoundly wilderness-touching experience. We're going to carry on through the Umluamati into the setting sun. Well, James, I think uh, I think you've beaten me this afternoon with an amazing wilderness experience. Well done. I'm very impressed. And it's fantastic that you got to see Karula. And I think she'll be hanging around with Taylor for some time. I'm looking for the little cubs. I think she's possibly left them in an area. Um, and hopefully we'll get to find them. Uh, nothing yet, but... Uh, but let's see, it's actually been, we've had a bit of a quiet afternoon, some nice birds around, but no sign of those little cubs just yet. So let's have a look and we'll see, uh, we'll see if she is or if those two little cubs are around. I'm hoping now that it's cooled down a bit, perhaps we've got a better chance of seeing them. Um, so let's have a look and see. Nothing just yet But like I say that's the way it goes sometimes um, but to be honest It's amazing how far Karula has moved from where she where those cubs were um, Because uh, she's quite far from here So it's incredible to see the distance she moves when she is out hunting and looking for food to help feed those cubs and the distance she'll cover to come back fetch them and take them back to the kill where they may feed. Now Chris, you wanted to know how far we track or look for animals in a day, do I think, on average? It's difficult to say. Sometimes you can track for two, three hours, two or three hours and, um, and have no luck. Other times you can drive for five minutes and something pops out in front of you. So um, it all depends. I'm just hoping that one of these Little ones have decided to climb up into a tree somewhere uh, Make it a bit easier for us to spot them That would be nice of them, but let's see So I'm going to scan very very carefully in this area Yeah, nothing yet. And again, I don't see any fresh tracks of them. See, they could be anywhere. They could be somewhere just south of our boundaries. Now, unfortunately, this is our boundary, so I'm unable to cross further south. And they have been around here with a kill, but, but in this area, 
Uh, again, nothing, no, no luck for us this afternoon. Oh dear, oh dear. That's the way, <laughs> that's the way the cookie crumbles, they say. So <laughs> sometimes you have the luck of the draw, sometimes you don't. But it's good, it's good, it makes us, and I, I was saying to Brian earlier too, you know, the thing is we always have to remember, this is, these are wild animals, you can never guarantee you're going to find them. And if they don't want to be seen, you're really not going to see them. And leopards, for example, especially leopards, they're incredibly elusive cats. Um, but who knows, they could still pop out. Shadows are becoming a lot longer now, temperatures dropping. Bit of a cool breeze in the air. It's a really amazing afternoon. Gorgeous, gorgeous afternoon. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we got to one of these little wallows where there was some uh, some water around, and we had a little leopard cub lying in the shade of a tree, or potentially drinking? That would be incredible. Let's see. Let's see. I'm trying to scan on top of the termite mounds and that in the area, like this one off to the right. That would have been a lovely spot for a, for a leopard. Let me just get through here. Out in the shade, uh, just through there, that would have been a lovely little spot for a leopard. But, alas, nothing, nothing yet. But there are a few little water holes. Another little mud wallow off to our left. And again, I'm just stopping to listen. Just here, maybe we hear little alarm calls or something, but... It appears to be very quiet at the moment. Oh, there's some grey hornbills, which just flew off. There's a grey hornbill up there and over there. Let's see if they sit in the open. Sit on that branch. There we go. Straight ahead. Hold on a second. Try to get a view of the grey hornbill. Stop, don't fly. Oh, the other one's chased it. Can you see that one through there? There's still one sitting over there. Brian, straight in the middle of that dead tree. Just getting glimpses of them flying out. And uh, uh, Thomas, you wanted to know if we've got shoebills in this area. No, we don't have shoebills out here. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think the only place, or one of the only places you get to see them is uh, if you start going north of Zimbabwe and Botswana up into Zambia. Um, if not further north into Zambia, I think that's where the shoe bulls occur. Never seen a shoe bull before, um, but we don't get them down here. Not in, not in this in South Africa. Um, now, I don't even know if I've got a picture of a shoe bull because I don't think they're considered a Southern African species. Let me just see. This will be quite interesting. No, no picture of a shoe bull. Uh, let me just double check. No, and as I thought, they are not considered to be a South Af uh, Southern African species, so I don't have them on my bird list. Now we are heading back towards Treehouse Dam. I'm just going to scan around that area again. Maybe there's something drinking now in the cool afternoon. Uh, 
uh, in, it's so it's so funny, but uh, in times like this where we are driving around and we're just really not having any luck with finding much wildlife, and it happens often, everyone, it really does. You get these moments, but uh, like I said, it's not a bad thing. It's good. There's there's still so much else going on. There's a lot of birds around, and it's just peaceful to be out here. But then often what I would say is let's stop, let's have refreshments and wait for the animals to come to us as opposed to looking for them. And sometimes it works. Also I suppose it depends what you have when you stop for refreshments. <laughs> you might see animals coming out of everywhere, every little bush. <laughs> Alright now James has got to a little water hole, let's go see what he's got over there. We've got a little water hole, but it's the second little water hole we've been at. And the first one we were at, uh, well, it contained three or four buffalo. And uh, we had a bit of an experience because, of course, we haven't seen buffalo here for goodness knows how long, so we've kind of forgotten that they like to lie in mud on a hot day like this. And, uh, well, we nearly stepped on them. Um, we reversed quite fast, and then we came around to this pan to see if we can get a view here. What about one? We can't see them from here. We might try a little approach. We might be able to get a little view of them. And some impala as well down there. Ah, they're the impala. But the buff are just behind the impala, sort of to the right hand side. And I think approaching them on foot might not be the best idea. Oh, that was special. That was another piece of speciality. They weren't quite as accommodating as Karula. They didn't charge us at all. They just got up and looked and sort of said to us, um, no closer, please. But that impala is quite special. It can see us, obviously. And it's a long way away from us, about 300 feet or so. And just in front of us, there's lots going on here. There's a yellow-billed hornbill I always have to pause before I say red or yellow-billed hornbill because for some reason, there, it's just jumped up into the tree. Just come a little closer, we'll have a look. For some reason, uh, my mind is unable to discern the difference between yellow and red very quickly. It's like east and west. I always say west, at least I mean east. The hornbill's just in here. Just stick with us. I'm going to walk up to this bush here and just look over the top there and see if there goes the hornbill and just see if we can't perhaps get a view of those buff. Hello. And Herbie's just walking to the left hand side to see if he can get a look and will excuse me not looking into your eyes too much as we try for a view of the beefaloes. Ideally, we'd want a termite mound quite close by so we could stand up on top of it. And I'll just check the wind. The impala have relaxed completely. Wind is... Yeah, wind is not bad for us. It's swirling a bit. It's not very really sort of one-directional. But it isn't blowing towards them. Impala is still watching us. Beautiful smell of the purple pan weed plant. And we're just going to go into this clearing and we might get a view. Nothing. I think they've moved. Oh, okay, we can hear oxpeckers in there. Quite close by. They've just flown up off an animal in the bush there. I can't see what it is but I'm pretty sure that's where the buffalo are. So we're gonna get out of here. Taylor is still with Karula. Let's get out of here. And you go back to the leopard with Taylor. <laughs> I feel like after that, let's get out of here. I need to say radio just to go with it. But yes, we're still sitting with Karula. She is now sat down 
under the shade of a knobthorn tree and there's still a couple of magpie shrikes hanging around and every time they alarm and basically shout in bird language that there's a leopard here she gets very upset and she starts to snarl and sort of look up at the tree and that's always very funny when leopards do that when they sort of express their frustrations towards the birds because she's trying very hard to stay hidden and they are ruining of course her chances of catching anything in this area. Are you turning into a vegetarian leopard now girl? No, of course she's not turning into a vegetarian leopard. She's had a little munch of grass as, uh, as she went around. She, look at her. Mmm, delicious. She's like, and this is always was my favorite thing is when I had guests from all over the world is everyone knows of course that the big cats are predators and they hunt for all sorts of different antelope species and really anything that they can get their, their paws on and when you'd come across a lion or a leopard uh, feeding on grass they always used to look at me as if I was completely bonkers and I had no idea what we were doing that was of course until I obviously explained her behavior now often cats will, f will feed on grasses like this and normally what it will do is it will actually induce vomiting. But Karula looks a bit thin, hey David? You can see her hips are sticking out a little bit, so she's possibly sacrificed whatever she caught, or, or maybe Hosanna actually caught his own meal. Maybe it wasn't Karula at all. But it's nothing to be worried about, so if you are getting a bit concerned, I promise you that she will be fine. This is very, very common for the cats to go without food for a couple of days, and of course they drastically lose condition but just as fast as they lose their condition, they are able to put it back on again. So don't worry too much. I have faith in this beautiful cat. And I think by tonight, she probably would have found, if she keeps walking through this drainage system, she's probably going to come across a couple of Steenbok or common Dacre. Or hopefully if she moves towards the more open area, she might get a herd of Impala. And I think that's ideally what she's going for at this, at this time, especially if she's a little bit thin and, and weaker than what she'd normally be. And it must be tough for her. It must be very tiring as we're moving through, well, while it's still quite hot during the day. Because as she does this, she's using a lot more energy than what she would be using on a cooler night. You can see she's panting. She's definitely trying to cool herself down. And it is, it's very warm here. Now, Pete B, you're actually wondering about if there's a specific reason that Karula is feasting on grass. Maybe she has feeling slightly unwell or something along those lines. Like I said, normally it induces vomiting when they do eat heaps of grass like that. A small amount won't do them any harm. I don't think that does too much to their bodies. But you see it, you see it often. Dogs will eat it, eat, but they'll eat copious amounts of it, of course, and then it makes them get sick. But she just ate a little bit, and I don't think that that is enough to, of course, uh, make her start vomiting. But she's she's looking desperately for something, any sign of movement. We're going to try and stick with her, and I'm really hoping she doesn't cross this drainage system. Otherwise, it's going to be, well, an interesting afternoon. But let's go back across to a Byron who has got a feathery friend to show you. And I've found some beautiful feathery friends, <laughs> lovely European bee eaters. Let's see, just hoping the light catches them. You get to see the color of these European bee eaters. They are beautiful. Usually we, t we tend to just hear them flying above us. And it's great to see them perched on branches like this. I'm just trying to see, there were quite a few around here. Let's have a look if there are any others. Oh, one or two, but those are, that's a nice view of them just preening themselves, or the one at the top is, in fact. There are a few flying above us. I can just hear them. I can't see them. Sometimes difficult to pick them up. They fly quite high. Some doves calling. It's a lovely, lovely afternoon. I am... Um, I've decided that I'm going to head down to Chitwa Dam, go spend some time with those hippos. 
see if there's any activity down there. Maybe we've got other animals coming down to drink, who knows? And we might have a beautiful sunset over the dam. So I think that is my plan for now on. I, um, I wouldn't quite say I've given up on the leopard cubs, but uh, I can't find them, basically is what I'm saying. I've had a look and I've had absolutely no luck. So let's head to the dam, um, go have a look what's down there, and then we'll come back into this area again and maybe a, a young leopard cub sticks its head out for us. A much better temperature now, much cooler. <laughs> it might be sounding a bit, a bit windy at the moment and I think it's, I'm just driving a little bit quicker than I usually do. But there is a bit of a breeze around at the moment. And also the, the breeze keeps us cool, which is lovely. Keep checking the termite mounds, Brian, you never know. And could be a, 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 what would we call a leopard on a termite mound? A basking leopard? Uh, what, what do you think we should call a leopard laying on a termite mound? A, uh, oh, <laughs> sunning leopard, a, a luxurious leopard lying on a termite mound. <laughs> Zander, you want to know what is the greatest sighting of 2016 that I had? Uh, oh, I had some really great sightings, but I think, you know, Zander, Safari Live, um, I think the best sighting I had last year was the one with the Inkahuma Pride when they jumped up and they were feeding on a buffalo carcass and then a herd of buffalo walked past, they jumped up, they stalked and tried to hunt the buffalo and, uh, and actually one or two of them jumped on the back of this buffalo, the buffalo turned and tried to fight them off, uh, kept the others at bay and then eventually managed to shake the lionesses off its back. And then as the buffalo turned to go back to the herd, an elephant came through, a young elephant came through, and, uh, and that elephant then chased the lions away. And the lions all went scattering off in different directions. And the elephant then had a little bit of a run at us. It wasn't, uh, wasn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily uh, very aggressive towards us. So I'm just having a look if there are any tracks, but there's some baboon tracks that crossed. Um, but anyway, that, that uh, sighting was definitely by far my favorite for last year, I think, especially on Safari Life. Okay, I'm going to head towards Chitra Dam now. Now, James has found something very small, but makes a loud noise, much like James. <laughs> This is very cool. The very first thing Craig said to me when I said that thing there, he said, is that what's making all that noise? And it was, it was screaming. It w is a cicada and sometimes known as a Christmas beetle. It's not a, it's not a beetle at all, it's a bug. And that one, I'm not sure which it is. It looks like an ax head cicada, but I mean, it could be any of them. And it's just stopped calling because it knows it's been spotted or it thinks it might have been spotted. And they're so hard to spot. When it was calling here under this tree, I thought, ugh, we won't see it, we'll try. And both Herbert and Craig went, oh, there it is. Now, if you don't know how it is that they make their sound, I will tell you, if you'd like to know. Would you like to know? I'm sure you would. 
If you can imagine an old school Coke bottle, remember the Coke bottle um, from which the Coke never tasted bitter, you know those glass bottles with a top, metal top, and if you push that top down it goes, and you push it back again and it goes, again. Well, that thing has basically got a Coke bottle lid underneath its, underneath its abdomen, and it's a membrane, and the membrane is attached to it, and what the muscle does is it pulls the membrane down, so it goes, and then it releases the muscle, and the membrane goes back up again. But it does that very quickly. And if you do it fast enough, it eventually sounds like And then it's got these echo chambers inside the abdomen here that amplify the sound, and it makes rather tremendous midsummer gin and tonic type of a noise. Wonderful, and you get them all over the world so everybody knows exactly what they sound like. And there are cicadas, of course, in the United States that live underneath the ground. Now, I do apologize again for James having a little bit of bad signal this afternoon, but that's just one of those things, unfortunately, when you're out here in Africa. But hopefully this makes up for it. Karula, we thought we lost her for a moment. David and I were panicking because we had to do a big loop around to get into this little drainage system. But luckily she popped out of the Tambuerti thicket. And well, now she kindly came down to have a little sip of water in this puddle. Thank you, lovely lady, after all the hard work you've made us do of travelling through the thick bushes this afternoon. We sometimes, it's not always easy. Sometimes you have to work exceptionally hard with these animals, but we don't mind, hey, David? Nope. We're not afraid of hard work. We love hard work. Okay, here we go. And now, well, I hope that you are all ready for this because this is going to be an interesting ride. Right, let's go back up. Just try and go straight up here, and it's a lovely little island actually that we're on at the moment. We're sort of between uh, two drainage systems. Ah, don't scratch my legs, tree. Mm, hopefully, she's going to come up over here, and let's hope she stays in this clearing for some time. She's just she's walking around in circles at the moment. What are you doing down? He's just just in there, David. Can't see her just yet, but I think she's going to come up here. She's sort of where this fallen tree is. She's just to the right of that fallen tree. You might actually just be able to see her head moving around. I can just see her shoulder. There she is. You can see her from the right hand corner of her screen. She's smelling for something. And even an adult leopard, if she was hungry enough, would grab a tortoise and even gobble it up. It's not just restricted to the young and inexperienced cats. Because something like a little leopard or even a scrub hare for Karula would be a nice little snack just to give her enough energy uh, to keep her going through the night again. It's like when you sort of have a sugar low, I suppose, and you snack on a little uh, bar of some sort, so you grab a handful of nuts. And it just gives you a little bit of a boost and a kick that's to keep you going. It'll do exactly the same thing for Madame Karula. Now come back over this way, please, young lady. But we'll be, I suppose we'll be patient, though I don't sound very patient this afternoon. Hello, Tristan. Tristan, you're wondering how big is a Karula? She's not a particularly large cat. I would say she wouldn't weigh more than about maybe 65 pounds, 70 pounds, somewhere around there. She's not huge. Definitely seen much larger females uh, than, well, than the size that she is. And I'm just trying to figure out what she's doing. Obviously, you can see exactly what we're seeing now. She finished sniffing around there. Yes, here she comes. She's just coming out to the right, David. You actually might have a better view. There we go. David's got a much clearer view than what I can because he's a little bit, well, he's much higher up than I. So he's able to see over this low-lying shrubbery. And she's, she's smelling. I think she's also scent marking a little bit around here. Maybe there was another leopard. 
nearby every now and then when she was in there, I saw her rubbing her cheek against that fallen log. Isn't that light gorgeous? See how it just catches her eyes every now and then? That's really quite special. Come on, girl. Now, I don't know if I'd be brave enough to walk through there because that, that looks like that shrub has got lots and lots of thorns on it. Yes. That wouldn't be very nice. David, would you be brave enough to walk through that? Sure. sure. I think when Karula moves out of here, we're going to have to see you do that. I'd be crying. Look, even, even she's being careful. No, girl. Yes, that one has got very sharp thorns on. Actually, what are you doing? She's, she's, de she's smelling. She's very interested in something around here, and of course only Karula knows what she's interested in. Fortunately, we haven't been able to communicate with, th with cats. I wish we could. Brian and I often chat about how we wish we could speak to animals. And I think it would be the best, best thing to have if anybody, if you worked with animals at all, with whatever it may be that you do. But it would make safaris fun and interesting. She's going to pop out now and it's actually going to be a very nice view. Here she comes. I'm worried that we're going to lose her, so we're going to quickly just have another look at her. She might walk right past the vehicle. She's not far from us now. Because if she does cross this drainage system, I think we're going to be in real trouble. And this could possibly be the last time that we see her. Hello, girl. Definitely listening, hoping she's going to hear a little branch snap. All the leaves rustling as the her prey might be moving through. She's coming right up to the vehicle now. Isn't this so cool? She's going right behind David. Look at that. Not a worry in the world. I'm going to turn around because she's walking in the long grass. Yes, this is, I think this is going to be our last view of her because as she disappears into this little part we are not going to be able to follow her. It is impossible. We can always try and go around but whether we'll catch her in time I'm not sure. Oh no, there she goes. She's just going to take a lay down. Fantastic! So we might be able to see her again. We'll stick with her as long as we can. But finally Byron has arrived at Chitwa Dam and I'm sure he's got lots and lots of hippopotamus to show you. Uh, hip, hip, hip hop anonymous. <laughs> no, no hippopotami just yet. We want to show you a crocodile first. Have a look at that crocodile lurking in the, in the shallows. It's quite a large crocodile, in fact, and he was swimming around. There was a water buck. That was coming down to drink, and we thought we might get a bit of action. Where is that water buck? Uh, there he is. But I think we, I think it's a bit of wishful thinking to think that the crocodile will go for a large water buck like that now. You never know. They're very opportunistic, the crocodiles. But that, just had a look. That water buck is very, very um, careful and nervous of the water because it knows these crocodiles are lurking around here. But isn't that nice? Nice to see that rather large crocodile lying in the water. And it, it, I mean, look how well camouflaged. It does almost look like a log, doesn't it? What I'm going to do is I'm going to move up onto the dam wall. And we're going to get a view of some wonderful hippo. As well as, I think we're going to get a nice sunset from here this afternoon. Uh, but just look at the light from up here now. Beautiful, beautiful afternoon sunlight. And we've got... Um, yeah, Liv, you can't believe how big that crocodile was. And it's hard to actually gauge how large it was when it is in the water because a lot of it's all under the water. But it did look like a rather large crocodile. To be honest, 
I would not go swimming in this dam. If the crocodile didn't get you, the, the hippo probably would. And there are a lot of hippo around here. I think I estimated at somewhere between 20 or 30 hippo in this dam. Um, there's a little yawn. And that's what I wanted. Perfect. I'm used to afternoons at dams like this when there are a lot of hippo around. They tend to get a little bit more active, displaying like that, doing some yawning, thrash, thrashing their heads about in the water. Um, it is a lovely time of the afternoon to get to two dams. And um, I noticed something else. Let's just have a look. I uh, have a look on the. Why is that hippo? bobs away and <laughs> blows a bubble. <laughs> There's, have a look on the opposite side of the dam. There are some in Yala and it looks like the males are having a bit of a dispute over there. Let's have a look. Oh, aren't they beautiful? Three big males. Oh, there we go. That's quite interesting. You don't usually see them fighting. But I have seen males fight before. Now that doesn't look like serious fighting. That looks, oh, hang on. Oh, this is great. That's quite exciting. Um, like I said, that doesn't look like serious fighting, though. I've seen Inyala fight seriously, and it gets very, very aggressive. And there's also a few bush buck around. What is it, mate? Uh, See those two are fighting again. You know what I think they're possibly possibly doing is is testing one another, and it's a it's a case of learning how to fight. They will compete at some point for females, but this is definitely not a serious fight. This is more just I think a bit of playfulness and a bit of testing. And it's a bit windy now on top of this dam wall. Um, I'd just like to move quickly and bear with me because I think I'm going to get you a lovely silhouette. Um, I've just noticed and I'm hoping it, it happens. Let's just see. James wants to say goodbye but give me a second. How's that little silhouette there? Look at that. Before James says goodbye, James, just hang on a second, please. Let's just look at that beautiful silhouette. Isn't that amazing? Before the sun drops, because I think the sun's going to drop just beyond that tree line very shortly, and we'll probably lose the effect of the sun in that tree. And the wonderful hippo sound behind us. Ah, you see, our afternoon is definitely getting a lot better. <laughs> Things are happening for us now, Brian. Alright, I'm going to hang around at the dam for a little bit longer. Let's head over to James so he may bid you farewell and head back home. Well, it has been a lovely walk, a highly successful walk with Karula the leopard, the queen leopard. Some buffalo, some impala, some hornbills and various plants and things. I do apologize for our technical glitches, uh, but it's just what happens when you're wandering around in the bush felt trying to broadcast live on foot. We had a wonderful time and thank you for coming on our walk with us. We're going to leave you now as we head on to quarantine. If that angry elephant is still there, then we might come back and see you. Otherwise, it will be only tomorrow that we see you at 0500. I said 0400 yesterday, which of course is absolute nonsense. It's 0500. Come with us on a little walk if you like. I don't know where we're going after you've been with me, but we'll hand you over back to Byron on Chitwa Dam. So until tomorrow, bye bye. <laughs>shortly and that's exactly what it's done but at least we got to see that beautiful silhouette and we still got a lovely silhouette of this tree 
Looks like a dead knob thorn. Hoping these hippo call for us again. Ah, lovely. Isn't that great? Really, really lovely. I love sitting at dams this time of the afternoon. It's nice and cool. And let's watch some of these hippo. Maybe we get some more. Ah, Ralph the dog. You wanted to... <laughs> interesting name, Ralph. Uh, Ralph wanted to know if the crocodiles drink water or do they get moisture from the food. No, they would definitely drink a bit of water. Um, um, they, you know, just like any other reptiles, they do need water. But, um, uh, you know, they would obviously get a lot of moisture from the food too. But with being in the water and feeding on animals in the water, they definitely drink, drink water. There's a red-chested cuckoo calling frantically in the distance. I'm sure you could hear it. Um, now, Rebecca was busy reading a question to me. Unfortunately, she cut off there. Rebecca, just give me that one again, please, if you don't mind. Uh, and Jenny wants to know if the crocodiles would eat the baby hippo. Uh, Jenny, no. I mean, to be honest, it could happen. It could indeed happen. Uh, however, the young hippo are very, very well protected by the adults. And crocodiles generally stay out of the way of hippo. They are very big, very powerful. And those teeth. And that looks like a youngster over there. Not quite a baby, but it is a younger hippo. Smaller head, much, much smaller. The one on the right. So Jenny, they, um, they are well protected. Those adults would keep any crocodiles away. And, uh, and they definitely... Uh, I mean, every time I've seen hippo go close to crocodiles, the crocodiles move out the way. Interesting to see how they sometimes rest their heads on one another. See, they're all getting quite active now. This is really great. Looks like they're almost using that stump in the water as a, as a rubbing post. Just trying to scratch their backs a little bit. Must be honest, I'm a little jealous. This water looks very, very inviting this time of the afternoon. Lisa the hippo definitely come out of the water. And, oh, there's a little yawn from a small hippo. So, Lisa, they do move out. They will go and feed in the evenings. Now, we've got these beautiful clearings off to our left. And there's actually a lot of wildlife on there at the moment. But just off to the left of the dam, there's a lot of clearings with a lot of green grass. And that's where the hippo will feed during the course of the evening. They are herbivores, so they need to leave the water to go and find good grass to feed on. So they generally leave early evenings. They'll go off, feed for a few hours, and then return back to the water. They will also lie on the banks of these water holes in winter. When there's... Uh, when they. Sorry, I'm just having a look. I thought I saw something. But uh, when there's... Uh, when when the water is very very cold uh, the hippo do go and lay on the banks to warm up and bask in the sun during the day and then return back to the water again later but they definitely leave the water mainly for feeding I'll go off in, in search of green grass it's amazing that cuckoo hasn't stopped once red chested cuckoo lovely to see a dam so full 
I'm um, surprised Biffle's hook isn't a lot fuller to, um, based on all the... There's a little yawn from one. There we go. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Great. See how they stretch their necks right out the water. As I was saying, I'm surprised Biffle's hook hasn't, had, well, hasn't filled up a bit more. Biffle's hook, damn, there's a lot... I mean, we did have a lot of rain, so I'm, I'm very surprised. But maybe we will still be receiving some serious storms and those dams will fill up even more. Uh, now, Taylor's got a wonderful bird's eye view that she'd like to show you. Now, of course, we're looking at the drone now and you can see the beautiful sunset, the oranges, the blues as they're sort of fading into the oranges and the sunset is only going to get better. All those beautiful cirrus clouds are going to catch a light with the different colors. Isn't that just absolutely spectacular? A little bit of pink starting now. And apparently you can see, of course, the beautiful Drakensberg Mountains. Now, I'm, of course, in the vehicle. I've still got Karula, so I'm just trying to keep eyes on her. So I'm going to keep moving. You're going to hear the sound of the engine because I don't want to lose Karula, of course, as we found her again. But isn't that just absolutely beautiful? I'm sure that the Drakensberg Mountains were beautiful dark blue. But you're back with us. Here we go, we're going to have Karula pop out right next to the vehicle. She's just coming through the shrub now. And there she is. Hello girl. And she's on the move again. It's cooled down quite a nice bit now. And you can even see that her pace has picked up. She wasn't moving quite as quickly when it was exceptionally hot, when the sun was still at the top of the sky. She looks a lot more active now. We're going to have to keep trying to move and I really hope she doesn't go back down into this drainage system again because it's, uh, it's difficult to try and follow her. We'll try and sneak through here. Oi, sorry, <laughs> that was a little tree, a little fallen over branch we drove over. Oh no Karula, don't go in here. David, just watch yourself here. She had, has had squirrels alarming at her. She's had everything shouting at her this afternoon. She's not impressed. Oh my goodness, we're never going to be able to follow her here. We'll try and watch her for as long as we can. But you can see how thick it is and it's almost impossible for a vehicle to move around. Now she started creeping. Look how carefully she's watching where she puts her feet. I think though there's a couple of fallen thorn trees around, so I think that's what she's watching out for. Nothing nastier than a thorn in your paw, and especially well that will put a dampen on her hunting mood. Uh, on her hunting mood, she'll have to take it out before she can carry on. But she's looking. She's looking for anything. The fact that she's going towards these small shrubs and looking around means that she's desperately hungry. Right, we're going to leave Karula now, where well, I don't think we're going to be able to follow her unfortunately, but let's go across to Byron, who's got a different view of the sunset. Oh, have a look at that everyone. Isn't that magnificent? Perfect, perfect sunset over the African bush. Look how quickly that sun disappears. You can hear the splashing of some hippo behind us, just moving through the water a little bit. We're going to wait for that sun to disappear completely first. I'm so glad there's a bit of cloud cover, it just gives it that additional bit of extra golden light.
gun. <laughs> And the hippo calling behind us. Listen. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? Really, really beautiful sunset. Wow. I haven't seen a sunset that beautiful for quite some time. They, they all are lovely, but um, I don't know, for some reason that just, uh, this is a lovely spot to see the sunset. I'll remember this. And you know, as I said, it's just so peaceful being here at the moment. There's so much going on, you know, there's, there's Inyala around, there's Impala on the clearings, there was some water back in the background, there's Hippo in the water, there, we know there's one or two crocodiles in here, we saw them. So there's so much going on here, and then that's not to mention all the bird life. You can hear the red bull buffalo weavers, you can hear Egyptian geese, you can hear uh, the doves, the cuckoo has gone silent for them for now. Tammy, you want to know how long hippos live for? Now, if I'm not mistaken, hippopotamus, hippopotami, <laughs> hippopotami, um, probably live, I think it's, I think it's between 30 and 35 years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I stand to correction, and again, you know, a lot of different books would, uh, would give you different information, it depends, is it in captivity, is it in the wild, but, uh, but I, think, uh, I think it's about 30 years, 30 odd years um, in, in the wild, that would be an average lifespan of a hippo. Uh, now, Tammy, you also want to know how often hippo babies are born or the young of hippo now if i remember correctly i think the gestation period is about 250 days so 250 days and then they look after that calf for at least a year or two before they decide to give birth to another one so maybe once every three or four years um, you'd have you'd have a female giving birth to another calf i would guess somewhere around that and that again is very quick arithmetic in my head which is not good at all <laughs> on the best of days but uh, somewhere around there i'd say three or four years once every three or four years a giraffe crossing the clearing straight ahead of us i don't know you brian will be able to get her there we go just caught a glimpse of a giraffe walking across the clearing wonderful let's see if it comes out behind those trees i think it will hang on let's be patient oh look too uh, corinne i'm not sure where you heard that the giraffe population are declining i have not heard that at all and there's definitely still plenty of giraffe around. I think one of the reasons why we're not seeing as many of them is because there's a lot of food and water all over at the moment. So they've just dispersed throughout the entire game reserve. Um, there's still a lot of giraffe around and um, yeah, I, I have definitely not heard of the, the population declining at all. Like I say, the giraffe will just move into areas where there's good vegetation to feed on. They prefer acacia trees, trees that they get a lot of nutrients from, and everything is green at the moment, and the bush is thick. So if a giraffe's feeding in the, in the tall trees, you're not necessarily going to see them very easily. They don't stand out. Fish eagle above the giraffe. Oh. And look at that fish eagle. 
Look at that beautiful fish eagle above the, the giraffe. We didn't even see it there. Well spotted, Brian. Oh, isn't that a lovely view? Well, we're going to leave the hippo and all the birds and all the animals around here for now. Start making our way back towards Juma. But Taylor's got something else in a pan she'd like to show you. We have managed to find three buffalo sitting in a little jacuzzi. It's perfect for the three of them. There's just enough room. They may even be able to squish one more in there. But I was wondering when we were going to see bu uh, wallowing buffalo. It's been ages now. And I wonder if perhaps these are the same buffalo that James was looking at earlier or was trying to get a view of. I'm not sure if it was this area that he was. But it seems like one cow the one sitting at the back with two bulls. And one of the bulls you'll actually recognize. And I'm going to reposition, but it's basically this one over here. I'm going to show you his face and you'll know exactly who he is. I won't even need to tell you. I'm just going to go a little bit. I'm going to drive away from them and then we'll turn back towards them. Here we go. That's actually a much better view of all their faces. <laughs> a look who it is. <laughs> I'm sure that you all know this buffalo very, very well. And if you don't, please let everybody know which buffalo this is. You can, I'm sure you're all having a Twitter conversation about it now. But it is our friend. Um, <laughs> Deborah, armchair traveler, you say that this is a bakuzi. Very, very clever. Play on words. You're very punny. Very, very punny. And oh my goodness, look at that female as she ruminates. David, look at all of that saliva coming out of her mouth. That is terrible table manners. If I was chewing like that, my mother would, well, she'd be up in arms. But that is delicious, and of course the buffalo don't know any better, because there's no such thing as manners out here. You do what you have to do in order to survive. But a beautiful cow. She's actually got a very deep set of horns. You see how they sort of grow quite low down and then they curve back up? Now that is actually a very good set of horns to have uh, if you're wanting to fight off a lion. The problem comes in when your horns, and particularly for the boys, because you see it more with the male buffalo, is that their horns sort of curve too much back towards the big boss, so the big helmet on their head. And that becomes sort of quite useless because if a lion was trying to attack a buffalo and a buffalo is trying to defend itself, it needs to use those sharp horns to hook underneath the lion and often they will launch them into the air. But if your horns are pointed too close to your boss and there's not a big enough gap between the boss and the tip of the horns, then unfortunately they're not very useful. But those female horns will be exceptionally dangerous. I think that they're going to spend the night here by the looks of it. Yeah, that one's getting very comfortable now. <laughs> he looks like he's having a grand old time. He looks like an older bull, actually. The one just on the left. He's got a nice big dewlap. He looks like he's he's been through... Oh, I'm so exhausted. I just want to have a little rest here. Just rest my eyes for five minutes. That is obviously the voice now of that buffalo. That's what I get in my head. No, not getting comfortable. Come on, do a big roll around for us. Make some bubbles in that jacuzzi that you're in. But this will be cooling them down quite nicely. But I'm sure that that water is quite warm. I don't know how refreshing that water would be to you and I. But I suppose it's better than, well, just standing out and about. And I'm sure as the outside temperature it cools down a little bit and this breeze picks up, it'll actually probably be quite satisfying. I'd probably get out now because I'm sure that if you're damp and you know what it's like, if you go swimming or if you have wet hair and the day starts to cool down and a breeze starts to pick up, it's actually very refreshing and it keeps you nice and cool. Oh, David, did something bite you? Something, well, David said something hapst him which is, I suppose, a very loose Afrikaans word for bite, eh? <laughs> Hello, Emma. Emma, you're wondering what species of buffalo is this? This is an African buffalo. So it's the species that we get down here. 
You get the Asian buffalo, well, in, in Asia. But these guys are very happy here and, well, happy that the Nkuhumas aren't around. But I'd keep an eye out because we know how far that those Nkuhumas can travel in one night and it wouldn't surprise me if it only took them an hour or so to walk all the way from Sydney's Dam to where we are. We're not far from Chele Pan, we're just at those mud wallows just east of Chele Pan. So they could very well get here in time. And I'm sure you can hear the Birchall styling which is just off to our right. It's actually quite beautiful David. That one sitting in the tree, maybe we can have a look at that as well. And it's singing away giving off its last call. Desperately chanting away. And I love this time of the day. This time of the afternoon and then of course the very early morning. And that sky is also just beautiful. Isn't that a lovely song? of that virtual styling. The cicadas are also starting to sing now, the odd turtle dove, I'm also being bitten. It's all happening today David, hey? all happening today but I think we're going to keep moving on. Let's see what else we can find, seeing as though we're having so much luck this afternoon. Bye Buffalo! I hope to see you, well I hope to see you tomorrow. We're going to see what else we can find here. Maybe we can get a silhouette tonight. So we're going to head towards, I think, Quarantine Plains. Let's go across now to Byron and see what, well, his plans are for the last couple of minutes of the show. So I'm back on Juma at the moment and just scanning around to see if there's any sign of those young leopard cubs, but nothing yet. Um, you know what could have happened is perhaps Karula took them away from that area because this morning there were hyena around there apparently. Um, may have taken them away and left them in a drainage line somewhere as she continued moving on. So they could be anywhere right now, I'm not too sure. Maybe we'll have more luck tomorrow. At least we know which area she was in this evening. So we can start looking around there tomorrow morning. Um, I was getting a bit panicky at the point so wasn't really finding much but the, the afternoon finished off really nicely at Chitwa Dam uh, with all those hippo and uh, the crocodile and all the other animals around the giraffe it was great to see giraffe again wasn't it a lot of bird life it really is a fantastic little spot and uh, I must admit I think I've found my favorite little sunset viewing point so I will use that from now on Alicia, you're a new viewer. Welcome. Lovely to have you. Now, unfortunately, it's, the show is going to be ending soon, but it's great that you've joined us. At least you know about it, and you can join us every morning and every afternoon for our drives. And just log on, and you can watch and hopefully learn quite a bit about wildlife and about Africa. seen any chameleons for quite some time. I wonder if there are any of those about at the moment. I'm sure there are but the bush is so lush and green probably be very difficult to find them. Doesn't seem like there's anything around at the moment to show you, but thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I really hope you've enjoyed it from myself and from Brian and the thumb. <laughs> Where's the thumb? The thumb there? There we go. Thank you very much, everyone. Let's head back to Taylor and she'll say goodbye and end off the show. See you tomorrow. We're desperately trying to make it back towards the quarantine plains, but I don't know if we are going to make it in time, unfortunately, because we're a little bit further away. We're trying our absolute best, of course, to see if we can 
we can indeed get there. Now, just in case you have forgotten, we have got a TV series running at the moment with Nat Geo Wild, and we'd love for you to continue watching us. We've got six episodes to go, and that happens every Sunday night at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Like I said, unfortunately, it's only applicable to you if you are living in the United States. And, well, we hope that you watch, and we hope that you have chats with us. And it is, of course, loads and loads of uh, fun. And we're still waiting to get the... Um, have we, we've got Karula, we've had her family now, we've had, who have we had? We've had the Nguhumas finally, we've got them, but there's still lots of other characters that we need to still introduce to everybody. So hopefully in the next six episodes, we're going to be graced with the presence of the Styx Pride. Hopefully some of the Birminghams, because I don't think the Birminghams have been seen uh, just yet. And hopefully a male leopard may be quarantined or, uh, or maybe of course, Tingana, hopefully he makes an appearance too. But we're getting there slowly, revealing all the characters one by one. We're almost at quarantine, but we've only got about a minute to go. I don't know, David, do you think we can do it? Yes. I'm pushing the boundaries. I'm going as fast as I can, but there's a couple of big bumps. Let's go. I don't know. I think it's going to be tough. It's going to be seriously tough. Let's go. We've got a minute. We're almost there. I can see the big marula trees starting to appear in the distance. I think we are going to make it. Yay! We're here. We're the wildebeest, David. We're the wildebeest. David says he's looking for the wildebeest. I'm looking for them too. I want to say good night to them. Where are you? Where are you? I can see angry Ellie. Right, we're going to have to say goodbye to you, but it's been an absolutely wonderful afternoon. There's our favorite friend, the young elephant bull. Thank you to everybody who has made this show happen, to Byron James. Wasn't it great? We saw elephants swimming, hippos in the dam, crocodiles, and then, of course, Madame Karula, the queen herself. But we hope to see you tomorrow. For the sunrise safari from myself and David, have a lovely day. We'll leave you with the angry Ellie.